Good morning and welcome to the Planning and Placement Committee meeting of the 1st of June 2020. And may I extend a very warm welcome to my fellow councillors who have all volunteered to sit on this committee. I will now introduce the top table. Uh, today we have got my Vice Convener, Councillor Grant Stewart, Mr Kristen Smith, the Development Management and Building Standards Service Manager, Mr Paul Williamson, Team Leader, Mr Sean Panton, Team Leader, Solicitor Mr Colin Elliott and Mr Danny Williams, Committee Officer. Uh, can we go to Mr Williams, uh, can you give us any apologies or substitutions for today, please? Yep, yeah, thank you very much, uh, the convener. Um, so, just to make you aware, we've got uh, three substitutes. We've got Councillor Donaldson here substituting for Councillor Waters. Uh, Councillor Brock is in the meeting, she's substituting for Councillor Cuthbert. And uh, Councillor Bailey is substituting for Councillor Leishman. And we have a further apology from Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, just to remind you that this is a hybrid meeting. Uh, members joining virtually are reminded that if you leave the meeting during consideration of any applications, you are unable to participate or vote on that item when you return to the meeting. Unfortunately, this also means that if a member loses their internet connection during consideration of an item, they should not vote on that item. Please advise the clerk via the meeting chat that you are leaving the meeting or if you have lost connection and are therefore unable to vote on the item. And whilst we are operating as a hybrid meeting, for the proceedings today, can I ask councillors and officers to use the chat box to, to attract my attention, which all members should ac have access to? And I'm sure you all know Q for question, C for comment. Uh, I will now ask the clerk to advise of any members participating today and for all members to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced by the clerk so that this is clear in the recording of the meeting and can also be recorded for the clerk for the minutes. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, convener, and good morning to everyone. Um, uh, as convener says, just when I call your name, you can let me know whether you're present in the meeting. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, that's Councillor Anderson present there. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Yep, Councillor Bailey's present. Councillor Brown. Yep, Councillor Brown present. Um, Councillor Brock. Present. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Donaldson, I can see you're present here. Yep. Um, Councillor Jarsdale is present. Yep. <laughs> uh, I think there's a slight issue. You can't have the two, uh, two of these mics on at the same time, so that's something I probably should have thought about beforehand. So if I can see you in the meeting, I'll just say that you're, you're present for sort of dexterity. Councillor Illingworth, I can see you're present. Uh, Councillor James. Present, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, convener, we've heard from yourself. Uh, Councillor McLaren. Present. Thank you. Um, Councillor Stewart, I can see you're present. And Councillor Williamson, I can see you're present as well. So, convener, that's everyone who should be in the meeting is in the meeting. Thank you. Uh, we now will go move on to declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Right. Thank you very much. Uh, we move on. <coughs> we have uh, deputations today. Uh, can we agree on deputations on items five one one? 512, 521 and 524. Agreed? Agreed. Right, so we go. <clears throat> the minutes of the previous Planning and Development Management Committee of the 13th of April 2022. Uh, the minutes are not uh, present at the moment. Uh, can we agree to defer the minutes until the next meeting of the Planning and Placemating Committee? Agreed. Agreed. So we now move on to major applications and the first application is uh, 00195. It's the formation of a battery storage system with associated works and infrastructure of up to 49.9 megawatt at land 130 metres southeast of Cooper Angus substation. 
Pleasance Road, Cooper Angus. Uh, I will now ask Sean Panton to speak to the report. Thank you. I'll actually cover that uh, report convener. It's Christian Smith here, Service Manager for Development Management and Building Standards. And thank you, convener, and good morning, councillors, uh, to this, the first meeting of the new council session and a newly branded planning and placemaking committee, uh, which considers development management matters. Firstly, all members of the committee will have received an update circulation. This adds a condition 16 in relation to soil management and also makes the wording clearer in relation to condition 8. I hope this is all self-explanatory and it's asked that these amendments are included as part of the decision making today, superseding the version in the published report. So this first application before us today proposes an energy storage facility of, as we say, up to 49.9 megawatts capacity just south of Cooper Angus. Uh, in September 2019, Planning Commission was granted at this location for a similar facility and work subsequently commenced under Planning Commission 1900513FLM. However, as a result of design changes and modifications, including more efficient plant and equipment being available, the developer chose to depart from that consented scheme, those changes requiring a new application to be made to seek approval for the revised design. Therefore, some of those preliminary works are retrospective. I'll now move to a presentation to outline the detail and context of the proposals. Uh, and here we have our first slide, which identifies the context of the site uh, and surroundings. This is an aerial photograph showing the positioning south of Cooper Angus to the west of Pleasance Road. Uh, vehicle access to the battery storage compound will be taken off Pleasance Road, leading to the main body of the site to contain the energy storage facility, all as indicated in red on this image. Next slide, please. Here we see the previously approved energy storage layout showing battery storage containers, inverters, switch gear containers and welfare containers, as well as a construction and electrical grid compound. If you note the distance between the northern uh, most uh, containers and orange dotted line and to the top line in red, which shows the boundary of the site. Moving to the next slide. This pl plan shows the site is currently developed and therefore the retrospective elements of the application. Again, if you note the northern part of the orange highlighted area and the increased distance to that northern red line. Thank you. Next slide, please. We now move to the proposed site layout as it would be when completed. Members should note that Overall, the battery storage elements within the site have been moved further south or away from Cooper Angus than was the case in the approved planning permission. In addition, grouping of inverters and battery storage containers is more condensed, whilst the electrical grid compound and construction compound have been removed as they are no longer considered to be required. Overall, whilst the size of the site has not changed and reflects that of the previous planning permission, the occupied area is reduced considerably by approximately 900 square metres. And again, you will note the distances from the northernmost aspects of the proposal to the northernmost uh, extent of the red line site and the increased distance from that previous approval. Next slide, please. Here we see the landscaping proposals, including native trees and hedgerow, shrub and woodland plant mixes, along with grassed areas. It's clear that landscaping is focused to mitigate views from the north and to assist in integrating the development into the wider landscape. Particularly, there is planting along both the north side to the energy storage facility and the southern side of the access road, but also along the northern boundary of the existing substation which is the area to the left of shot. It's understood that the applicant engaged with the local community in the development of this scheme of landscaping. In addition to landscaping, an acoustic fence is proposed along the northern compound boundary to address concerns related to operational noise, that fence positioned behind the landscaping, so in itself screened. The reduced footprint of development has also allowed additional planting than required by the planning permission. For the purposes of orientation related to a photo I'll show next, the orange dot 
uh, highlighted areas running from the bottom right and from the north are pylon routes running from First Pleasance Road to the east and then from Cooper Angus itself. Next slide. We now move to a series of photographs and this first photograph looks west from Presence Road across fields towards the existing aspects of the energy storage facility and substation, which are beyond the ploughed field in the distance at centre of shot where the pylons head. Next. Now we are further up Pleasance Road looking northwest with again the substation and existing elements of the energy storage facility in the centre of shot just above and left of the tapered part of the ploughed field. Next. This time we can see both the pylons from before and others coming from the right out of Cooper Angus, which is further to the right of the photograph. The picture taken from the junction of the access with Pleasance Road across undulating farmland towards the site. The dark area and centre of shot being the existing elements of the energy storage facility. That is the centre larger pylon just to the right. You'll see a darker area. Obviously, all photos show the current situation and do not account for landscaping being implemented and becoming established. But thank you, convener. That now concludes the presentation for this application and we return to the satellite image. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, we now move on to deputations. Uh, Mr. Steve Galloway, he's an objector to the, the proposals. Audrey, do you have him? Is he present at all, Audrey? So Mr Galloway isn't, doesn't seem to be here. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Mr Tim Wheeler and Mr Charlie Von Schneider. Uh, they're uh, for the uh, agent for the applicant. Uh, are they here, Audrey? Yeah. Hello, Mr Wheeler. Can you hear me? Hello, Mr. Wheeler. Oh, hello. Um, sorry, I, I was just doing the star six. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, right, Mr. Wheeler, I'm, I'm going to hand you over to uh, the deputy convener who will explain the procedure uh, for the deputation. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Wheeler. Good morning. I am the vice convener for the. Sorry, I was doing the staff six. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hello, Mr. Wheeler. No, Hello, this is um, Steve Galloway. Okay, I beg your pardon. I um, think both um, Mr. Yeah. Wheeler and Mr. Galloway are now on the line, um, so there might be some crossover. One has just come in, and if we could maybe just ask them if they could switch off any other devices that they have listening into the message or we can get some feedback or uh, because of the delay in transmission we can hear um, what's already been said so if they could just use their phones for the time being thank you this is steve galloway i've done that yeah i i am doing that as well but i hope there's any feedback happening hello mr wheeler uh, mr schneider uh, is it possible for you to uh, switch off just to uh, come out of the call just now uh, and we'll call you back. Yeah. Or, or just go on to mute and we can hear uh, the previous deputation would maybe be easier. I think it's better if they drop out and then come back in and in the waiting room. That's OK. Audrey, we just got Mr Galloway there. Hello, yes, this is Steve Galloway. Right, Mr Galloway, I'm going to hand you over to uh, the vice convener. Uh, he'll run you through uh, the procedure for your deputation, OK? Thank you. Good morning, Mr Galloway. Councillor Grant Stewart, vice convener here. Can you hear me OK? 
Yes, I can. Um, thank you that you're going to make a deputation. Um, are you aware that you can have up to 10 minutes? I am. And I will give you a warning at nine minutes to allow you to make a summary. Is that OK? That's fine, thank you. And I will start timing you when you're ready to talk. So when you're ready, please proceed. OK, can I just ask you, it says on my instructions I need to dial hash six to unmute my phone, but is, is that necessary or not? Yeah, uh, you are unmuted already, Mr Galloway, so you can just uh, start your deputation whenever you're ready. OK, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd just like to make the following points about this proposal. Um, when the original battery storage development was proposed and approved by this committee in 2019, there were over 100 objections from residents, uh, the local community and community council. The public consultation was really a disgrace and had to be rerun. All of these objections were ignored. Many objections centered on the fact that the developer, Mr. Merchandani, was unable and unwilling to offer any information at all about the technical details of the development. We knew that his business model was to get planning permission and then sell it on to another company to build and run the facility. That's exactly what he did, and it's why Mr. Merchandani can never answer technical questions about the developments he applies for. As a direct result of this, the Cooper Battery Storage Facility was built off the incomplete and unbuildable plan presented to and approved by this committee. It was only because of the public bringing it to the council's attention that the fact that the development was being built at variance to the approved plan was even discovered and subsequently put on stock by Perth and Kinross Council. During the first online public consultation for this reapplication on the 1st of December 2022, Arcus Consulting, the developer's agent, lied on record to the public by claiming on three occasions that the facility was being built according to the original plan, only changing their mind when confronted by a local councillor who had been on site that day with a plan and confirmed it was in fact being built off plan. Misleading the public like this is clearly completely unacceptable and in a public consultation, uh, unacceptable in a public consultation process. This gross incompetence on the part of Arcus Consulting should be noted by this committee and uh, Perth and Kinross Council should be very aware of the unethical and negligent practices of Arcus Consulting. They should investigate this specific incident and remove them from representation on any future developments. Despite a clear transport management scheme being promised by Arcus and required by this committee as a condition of the development, throughout the build there have been numerous occasions, many photographed as evidence, when large articulated lorries approach the site by the wrong roads via Cooper Angus and narrow precinct street, putting children's lives in danger and causing ongoing disruption to residents. Your own planning application conditions stipulate that the TMS, as approved, shall be strictly adhered to during the entire site construction programme. The contractor has proved unable to control the route its sub subcontractors used, and this is clearly not acceptable. Also, despite assurances in the original and in this reapplication, that the local community would see direct benefits to Cooper Angus. It should be noted that there have been and will not be any, um, that, that, that there have not been and there will not be any direct benefits to Cooper Angus. A Greek firm has been brought in to build the facility and stabilising national energy is not a local benefit. Given the failure of the developer to build to plan and to control the traffic management of its subcontractors, and given the fact that the developer's agent, Arcus Consulting, misleads the public and this committee, we are very concerned that the extensive planting plan, which has at last been implemented, is maintained and allowed to grow to hide this very unsightly development. During the planting, we have already had the farmer landowner try on site to change the plan to allow a 12 foot gap for a gate through what was supposed to be a line of hedges and trees to allow access to one of his fields. Because much of the planting is on this farmer's land, what is to stop him from simply cutting it back or opening up gates? We therefore ask that this committee puts in place a very strong and written requirement as part of the planning permission conditions for all the planting that has been implemented as part of the approved planting plan to, meet, to be maintained and inspected over the operational life of the battery facility, not simply the next five years, to ensure that it is not compromised during this time. 
Finally, the committee should be aware that Mr. Merchandani, who generated so much opposition for the battery storage development, is now proposing, with the same landowners and Arcus Consulting, a huge solar farm adjacent to the site, larger than the whole of Cooperanga's town itself. Two farcical online public consultations, which showed no images, no 3D mock-ups, no technical details, and clearly showed no intention to take out on any comments from the public, show that Mr. Merchandani is about to do the same thing again on a monumental scale. We urge this committee to look very hard at his and Arcus Consulting's track record when evaluating that application. As we know, neither he nor Arcus are to be trusted. They will destroy our rural environment in the name of green energy to simply line their pockets and then move on, leaving us with an enormous eyesore for the next half century. These comments do represent the views of many local people, and I would thank you to take them on board when considering this and future applications. Thank you to listening to my comments. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. I will now hand you back to the convener, Councillor Massey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Galloway. Uh, I'll now hand over to questions for members. Are there any questions for Mr. Galloway from members? Councillor Drysdale. <clears throat> thank you, convener, and thank you, Mr. Galloway, for your uh, your presentation. Um, you have obviously made some strong accusations regarding the developer here. Um, I just wanted to pick up on your final, uh, one of your final comments when you said that your um, your views were representative of uh, a significant number of your fellow uh, local residents. Do you have any evidence to that effect? Has there been meetings of objectors uh, and are you speaking uh, formally on their behalf? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, the well, if the if the, um, the councillors on the committee were to look at the original um, application, um, you can see on record over 100 objections on based on the, the, the areas that I've been discussing. Um, we know subsequent, so that's 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 the first point. Um, the second one is that there have been there was a there was a consultation on site for this um, this reapplication, which a number of members of the public attended, and since then, um, and that was held in a in a small cabin uh, on the on the site of the um, of the battery storage, uh, to which a number of people uh, attended. Um, and then there was discussion amongst those those uh, people and people that they knew. Um, unfortunately, the the consultation um, event um, th that um, that was online was not accessible to 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 many people. Um, so it has been through local conversations and discussions that people have um, have re represented their views. I would say that on the landscaping plan that has also been part of that discussion. Um, and we are, you know, we are pleased with the landscaping um, uh, um, planting that has now been carried out, which again was something that, although um, I was one of the people corresponding with um, the uh, developer, that was I made it have made it clear all along that these are not just one person's views; they do represent people in the local area. What we're really concerned about is that this planting plan, which is which is good, and as long as it, uh, it it's, it's allowed to mature. And flourish um, will be satisfactory is in fact allowed to do that hence my comments um, I suppose the most important comments about this particular application which is that um, that planting plan is really maintained over the lifetime of the facility and not simply for the uh, stipulated five years that I think was in the previous application I hope that answers that question yeah thank you for your answer Councillor Braun you have a question uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, a couple of questions, if I may. Um, obviously, the, the, the points Mr. Galloway has brought up will query with the, uh, the developer in due course. But there's a couple of things, um, Mr. Galloway. And thank you for your presentation. Um, you're, you're aware, obviously, there's a, there's a planning uh, application already passed. Uh, if, if this was to be refused, you're, you're aware that the, uh, the developer could revert back to the original plan. 
Yes. Um, yes. And I, as I was saying, I'm. I'm. What I. What I would like the. I wanted to take this opportunity to make the, the the committee very aware of some of the challenges that we've already faced on this build, um, and therefore, you know, I can see that the and we we understand that the um, recommendation is to approve this. What we're wanting to make um, make sure of and to alert your attention to are some of the um, the details um, which we would like to be um, stipulated to make sure that. Some of the failings that we've already seen on the build, for example, not building to to the plan um, with the transport, um, the 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 the, the, um, the transport management plan not being adhered to, um, and etc. Be that those things be um, stipulated in writing and and inspected to make sure that they're actually adhered to um, as the rest of the build um, proceeds, and and you know to the point of the 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 extended. Um, planting plan. Um, we're we're pleased with that, and as I said, we just we want to make sure that if this is approved, um, as it's likely to be, that these are that the conditions that are applied to this in terms of maintaining um, that are are stipulated as part of of, of that approval. Okay, thank thank you very much, Tamina. If I can have a second question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, guys, yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, Mr. Galway, you, you talked about benefits. Um, obviously, this is a storage facility very close to Kupranga. Surely they would benefit um, from the storage of power should it be needed. That's, that should, should be a benefit to Kupranga, surely. I think when that question was asked of the developer, um, they were what they said was that it's simply a, a, a nationwide benefit. It's, in, it's, it's something that benefits the, the national grid. It doesn't benefit the local um, area specifically because that was a direct benefit. I was referring to, as is claimed in the in the documentation. And I think when the when the um, original application went in, the developer said, "Oh yes, there'll be lots of local employment. Um, there'll be you know, you know the construction phase will employ a number of local people, um, and that has been minimal, if any, um, as far as we understand." So it again, it's just drawing your attention to the fact that a lot of these things get claimed and are presented uh, and they look good in proposals, what we're asking is that they are implemented and that they actually do get delivered. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Camina. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No. Uh, thank you, Mr. Galloway, for your deputation. Uh, you can now leave the meeting. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. OK, we'll move on to uh, Mr. Tim Wheeler and Mr. Charlie Von Schmeider. Uh, are they in the meeting? Yeah. Hello, Mr. Wheeler, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll now hand you over Hello. to the deputy, de right. deputy convener, uh, who will uh, run you through the procedure of uh, your deputation. OK, thank you. OK. Good morning, Mr. Wheeler, again. Yeah. Um, is Mr. Charlie von Schmeider with you as well? Um, no, good morning. You, good morning. Uh, you're w wishing to make a deputation and uh, just to make you aware that you and Mr. von Schmeider have 10 minutes in total. Whether you want to split that up or your colleague to sits with you and um, to add comment. You have 10 minutes to uh, talk. Uh, I will give you a warning at nine minutes uh, to allow you to make a summary. Is that OK? Yeah, th thanks, Vice Convener. I, th I don't think we'll need the full 10 minutes. And I'm, I'm going to say a few words to start with and then uh, we can sort of deal with the questions that have been raised uh, by, by members. So uh, no, ha ha happy to fire away, really, if that's OK. Bev, whenever you start, I'll start the timer. So uh, please proceed. Then no, that's fine. It's start the timer. So uh, look, I mean, f fairly obviously, I'm a planning consultant with Arcus, and um, we've been advising the applicants on, on this project. Um, as you know, uh, Charlie von Schmeider, you know, he's, he's from Gresham House, and he's on the call as well. Um, 
the report prepared by the officers, look, it's very fair and it covers the background to the application. Um, you know, as you know, the, the site at Pleasance Road, it was granted planning permission in September 2019. And, and, you know, on the face of it, it's essentially a very similar form of development, a, a battery storage development. Um, the, the technology relating to battery storage, it's evolving quite rapidly and uh, following acquisition of the project from the previous application, um, it's been necessary to make some changes to the layout to accommodate a more appropriate format and of development. And I, th I think um, Mr. Smith mentioned that it, you know, it's actually a more efficient uh, form of development as well. Uh, and the applicants undertaken a full program of consultation with the local community, including inviting local residents to visit the site and discuss the project. And um, you know, we recognise that a number of concerns were raised during that process. Uh, particularly on visual impact of the development and landscaping, um, any possible noise issues, you know, comparing the, the previously approved scheme with the current one, and, and also issues around flooding. And um, what we've done together with the applicant is, you know, we've you know, gone to considerable effort to provide additional information to address these concerns. So, you know, a new planting and landscape mitigation plans being produced, which we think is a considerable upgrade on the 2019 proposals, uh, including additional tree planting along the whole of the northern perimeter of the site. Um, we've provided details of the acoustic fence and we've looked at the noise assessment to ensure that the council's and national standards on avoiding excessive amounts of noise are, are met. Um, the flood risk assessment that was carried out previously has been revisited and uh, you know we've ensured that the development as it's now proposed it won't cause any any harm or increased risk of um, of flooding due to due to surface water um, the access to the site is still to be gained via pleasance road but it'll be possible to use a greater proportion of the existing track and achieve a more sustainable form of development um, o overall members you know we fully concur with the conclusions in the officer's report that that all of the necessary matters involved with the application, they've, they've been properly addressed and, and the development won't harm the local environment or the living conditions of local residents. Um, can, can I also add that, you know, it, it's important to be aware that energy storage is vital to achieving, you know, a transition to a low carbon economy and meeting the, the net zero target by 2045. And, you know, I mean, we know that's something which the council itself supports through the climate action programme. So, um, I mean, really to pick up one of uh, Steve Galloway's point. Really, the, the, the question isn't whether it, it, it sort of supports the grid in the very immediate locality of the site. It's really a case of supporting the overall drive towards, you know, the low carbon economy and, and obviously tackling climate change. Um, and, and, you know, some more recently, obviously, climate, you know, for obvious reasons, energy securities, you know, come up on the rails as a really important issue. So, so, so members, granting planning permission today, it will make a really significant and worthwhile contribution to achieving these aims. So, I mean, thank you for listening and um, I'll really, I'll, Ch Charlie, I'll hand over to you if there's any, any points you, you want to make sort of further to that. Um, thank you, Mr. Wheeler. Yes, good morning, um, uh, Mr. Convener and Vice Convener and, and Councillors. Um, so, I just wanted to mention um, I'm from Gresham House. Uh, we have acquired the development from um, uh, be a power, uh, formerly known as Coronation Power, owned by um, Mr. Merchandani or, um, and developed by him. So we will be the, the long-term managers of the battery storage project at Cooper Angus. And the, the, the project itself is um, designed to help stabilize the electricity grid as um, there, there are differences in supply and um, demand of electricity on any given day and that those differences do increase as more and more renewable energy is, is put onto the electricity grid, for example, um, wind power or, or solar power. So, so there is a, a national need for, for electricity storage, um, but it also has, has a local benefit in the sense that it can help reduce blackouts and, and brownouts in any area. Um, just to address also some of the points um, Mr. Galloway made, um, 
so we're we're not linked to the the, the solar um, photovoltaic development at, at Cooper Angus. We we're merely owners of the um, battery storage project, um, and when we um, made the application for this change, uh, as Mr. Galloway said, we we had two public consultations, um, and then in addition to to the requirement, we had that on-site consultation where uh, I think something like nine or ten people um, attended, and, and we were able to give a presentation about uh, the, the technology itself. Um, following that, we we engaged with Mr. Galloway and other members of the community to discuss the. Um, planting plans uh, and they have been implemented in in conjunction with that consultation um, and I take his point on um, the need to, to make sure the planting is maintained in the future and we will have long-term um, operation and maintenance arrangements in place with contractors to ensure not only the, the battery plant itself is, is maintained but also the, the planting that is, has been put in and, and will be put in to comply with the planning conditions. Um, Then, uh, in relation to the traffic management plan um, breaches, uh, I, I agree there, um, there were, I believe, before Christmas, some instances where some delivery drivers um, did not follow the plan to approach from the south, but did approach through Cooper Angus Town. Um, and we brought this very clearly to the attention of the contractor who, who um, now make it very clearly um, make all delivery drivers aware of, of the requirements and they have a, a yellow card and a red card system in place to ensure um, this doesn't happen again. Um, there were also instances where, where um, deliveries were tried to be made to, to our site but in fact weren't for our site at all but the trucks had gone through the town so they, they weren't related to our uh, development. Um, then, yes, we've talked about landscaping. Uh, basically, that's that's it to wrap up. And um, Mr. Wheeler and I can take questions. Thank you, Mr. Von Schneider. I'll hand you back to the convener. Uh, thank you to both of you for the, your presentation. Uh, I'll now uh, offer it over to the members for any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Wheeler or Mr. Von Schneider? Councillor Broad. Seem to be the only voice there today. I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for your, your presentation. It was just a couple of questions, actually. Um, the first one: um, could you, What is the life of the of the um, the facility? And what's the lifetime of the facility? Um, I know it says in the conditions that if it's not used um, within 12, or there's not power in there for 12 months, it's decommissioned. But um, I'm just thinking that obviously there's future energy sources being planned which may be 15 or 20 years away uh, and they may not need these facilities so what, what would you expect to be the life cycle of this and obviously when it's finished whatever that is do you return the ground back to agricultural land uh, so the um the, the plant is made up of a few different types of equipment. Um, the sort of longest life part of the equipment uh, should last something like 25 years. Uh, so they include the transformers and the inverters, which convert the alternating current to the direct current. The batteries store um, the direct current. Uh, the batteries themselves will have a useful life of approximately 10 years depending on how heavily they're used in that time period. And our intention is to replace those batteries um, when they need to be replaced and dispose of the, the old batteries in a responsible way. So um, we expect that they, they may be able to re be reused in some instances or other otherwise recycled. Um, so overall we, we would plan to to operate the, the facility for as long as the um the lease and the, the planning permission allow uh, through a, a a planned replacement and, and refurbishment program 
Thank you. Uh, uh, and presumably when, when they're no longer required, you would return the land back to agricultural land? Apologies. Yes, yes, we would entirely recycle and, and reuse um, all the, the equipment on site and, and reinstate it to, to agricultural use. So um, I believe that's a requirement of the Planning Commission, but it's, it's certainly a requirement of the lease. Thank you very much. If, if I may come in, just one more question quickly. Um, there was a, a claim by Mr. Galloway that, the, um, that yourselves were making false claims on the plan itself, saying that the the new the new development fitted in with the original planning permission. Uh, I don't think you commented on that. If you could have a comment, please, on that. Uh, John, if you'd like to answer that one. Yes, please do. Yeah. Uh, no, no, Councillor Bonner, I mean, I think what happened was a bit unfortunate, really, a bit of a case of mis miscommunication, because at, at one of the consultation events, a colleague of mine was sort of asked a question about whether what the works that were going on on site at that time were, you know, the according to the approved plans or the uh, you know, the 2019 plans or or the you know the uh, the current proposals and you know um, it, with the benefit of hindsight it would have been better if she just hadn't tried to answer the question so you know you know she she was wasn't 100 percent sure of the position and and uh, you know it was, what what she said was quickly corrected by uh, the representative of the applicant who said well you know no look uh, for clarity the work you know the preparatory works that we're doing at that time they were basically the footprint of the current proposal. So, like I say, I mean, with, you know, with, with the benefit of hindsight, it, it, you know, it, it, it was just unfortunate what, uh, uh, what what happened at that meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Councillor Donaldson, you have a question? Thank you, Convener. Uh, both uh, Mr. Von Schmeider and, uh, and Mr. Galloway referred to the solar farm, the, the, the possible solar farm uh, adjacent to this site. Could I just ask, just so I can clarify, could I ask Mr. Von Schmeider, let us assume that that solar farm did not occur, it would obviously have to be a separate planning application. Um, is this site viable and sustainable in its own right without that solar farm? And Councillor Johnson, yes, just to confirm, so we're not linked to the applicant for the solar farm. Um, and yes, the battery storage site is, is entirely vi viable without a, a solar farm next door. OK, thanks. Uh, Councillor Williamson, any question? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, my question is about the uh, noise uh, rating. Um, according to the, the uh, conditions that are attached to the planning application, uh, the, the uh, site will have a noise rating of 35 decibels between 7 o'clock and 11 o'clock at night and then reduced to 20 overnight. I was just wondering if uh, someone could tell me how that was going to be achieved. Uh, I mean, that's maybe a question to sort of, uh, sorry, Tim, we were so maybe a question to direct back to the planning officers, but uh, the you know, really it's a combination of both the acoustic fence and also the you know the equipment that is installed has certain noise ratings and performance criteria that they have to make so um, you know what what we're saying from the applicant side is that you know those noise conditions will be complied with uh, so you know it's a, you know so it's a combination of having an acoustic fence and also the you know the procurement of the the necessary equipment that complies with that performance standard. Would it be okay to come back with the yeah. manager, please? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, g given your answer, um, that it's if in the, the, it further goes on as, as a further condition that if there was justified noise complaint, then the uh, applicant would um, uh, employ a consultant to uh, do an, a noise assessment, and you would try and tr to resolve that. Would it not be better to incorporate that into the original design to try and reduce the noise? to an absolute minimum in the first instance. Charlie, I don't know whether you want to want to jump in on this one, but, um, but you know, it's a kind of, you know, um, 
the equipment exists at the current point in time that, that it's appropriate to procure for the for the development, and it and you know it has you know it has a certain level of, of noise output, and you know that that's been looked at and it's found you know with the addition with the mitigation of the acoustic vents, it will meet it will meet the um, uh, the, the planning conditions. So that's you know it's a kind of you know circular argument really. Charlie, I don't know if you want to say anything more on that. Yes, yeah, sure. I can comment on the on the noise output of the plant. Um, the, the noise output is is mainly comes from cooling fans um, for the batteries and for the inverters. Uh, the transformers as well do make a, a, a fairly low hum at, when they're in operation. The battery storage plant won't be operating at, at all times, so it won't always need these these cooling fans on. The the design, the acoustic fence and the noise mitigation design has been done on the assumption that all noise emitters will be on at the same time, which we believe will be a rare occurrence. Um, but even if they were, the, the acoustic fence that has been built um, would attenuate the noise down to that nighttime level of, of 20 decibels. Um, and yes, if, if there's a complaint, uh, we'd be happy to investigate and, and make any changes necessary to, to ensure the noise, the, the, the noise levels committed to are actually adhered to. Is it possible to ask a further question, Karina? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, my next question is about flooding. Uh, the site has got a um, one in 200 a year flood risk and uh, part of the conditions are that um, your, your site must not be raised above ground levels. Um, I'm just concerned or want reassurances about how the site is going to be made safe in the event of uh, excessive surface water or flooding. So the, the, the site has been um, built in such a way so as not to increase flooding caused. Um, so it's not taking up any floodplain, any additional floodplain area um, and any runoff from the site will, will still go in the directions it would have gone um, before the, the, the development took place. Um, so yeah, there are um, burns and um, drainage areas around the site, which which will still continue to be used. To answer your question, Councillor Williamson. Uh, I'm afraid no, it doesn't. Um, uh, the, the specific question was: Is the site it does has a, have a risk of flooding? And I'm just seeking reassurances about. Is the site safe in the event of the one in 200 year flood and what measures have been taken to make the site safe if the site does get flooded? Oh, apologies. Um, sorry. Um, in, in terms of flood risk, the, the sensitive electrical equipment is, is, is um, lifted up higher above ground level um, and also there are um, you know, electrical fuses and and switchgear, which would um, which would trip out and and stop the the plant from operating in the event of um, flooding causing any damage. Yes, yeah, so I just, I just want to add yes. as well that the the you know, Arcus has a team of hydrologists who looks at the, the the flood risk issue. But as part of that, it's not just a case of not increasing flooding off off site. It's also that the scheme itself is designed to be resilient in the event of, of flooding, sort of being, which is basically what, 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 uh, what uh, Mr. Von Smythes has said. Can I answer the question now? Uh, uh, Councillor Langworth, you have a question? Um, two, two questions, if I may, convener. Um, the first question is, can you give me a little bit more detail about your plans for maintaining the screening? Certainly. So through our uh, contractor, um, Metka, they they are um, engaged to to build the facility, and they have subcontracted the the planting work to to a specialist landscaping company. 
um, and they will be engaged for uh, initially the first two years to to maintain uh, the planting and to re replace any um, trees or plants that have died. Uh, and we will continue monitoring the, the planting uh, throughout the lifetime of the of the uh, battery storage facility. So, you know, there, there will always be an operation and maintenance contractor and we'll ensure that their scope includes the the, the monitoring and, and maintenance and, and refer refurbishment and repair of, of the planting. So, so the hedges and the, the, the screening. Thank you for that. Uh, the second question is, can you give me a little bit more detail about the yellow and red card system for, for presenting, preventing uh, traffic misdemeanors? So if a delivery driver has taken the wrong route, they would receive a yellow card, meaning it's a warning. And if they do it again, they will no longer be permitted to, to provide deliveries to the site. Uh, and, and if it does reoccur, then they would be given a red card and, and they, they would no longer be allowed to, to deliver. So that would be something communicated to, to the suppliers and to the delivery companies. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLaren, you've got a question? Yes, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. I think this question is probably directed to Charlie from Gresham House. It's My question is with regard to noise. Noise is a recognised pollutant um, and can be entirely disruptive to residents' communities. So, are, is uh, the company Gresham House considering undertaking their own noise assessment over different periods, weathers, times of years to ensure that they are within the range, not relying on uh, residents to make the complaint for them then to show the communities that they are adhering to these um, crucial noise levels? Um, thank you, Councillor McLaren. So we've done a design and and an assessment um, through uh, specialist noise consultants to to make sure that the design um, complies with the with the level. However, you're right. In practice, it, it may be different. Uh, we currently don't have any plans to to do noise um, monitoring um, through the lifetime of the plant. Um, the, the plant itself, I believe, is is over 100 metres from from anybody's house, um, and you know we we can definitely stay in touch with with people living nearby to to see if they're affected. Um, but um, yes, we we're not currently planning to to do noise assessments uh, on an ongoing basis unless um, you know the, the, a requirement arises. that answer your question, Councillor McLaren? Well, it does. Um, yes, um, but I think the the awareness of wind directions that can change um, how noise can affect. So one day it may be acceptable the day that you test it when you've built the site and you say that it's designed, but you know, <laughs> is it designed for all weather conditions? So I, I have a strong concern about the noise element ongoing um, for the local community. Thank you, Councillor McLaren, just calling Thank you. here just to be careful about making statements. At this stage. Sorry, 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 <coughs> Although sorry. I, I do understand where you're coming from. It's a question you can address to officers in a few minutes time. The same, okay. You could put the same question okay. then. What I would say at the moment is what's in the conditions as a standard approach. Yes, yeah, I accept that. Thank and you. You can address the same question to officers in a, a minute or a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Yeah, okay, Councillor Barr. Thank you, Commissioner. So I was just coming on the, on, on the back of Councillor Beaworth's question about the transport controls with the red and yellow cards. S simple thing, maybe I've missed it, but um, if, if a driver turns up at the site, um, how do you know if he's gone the wrong way? Uh, are you relying on people to report this or, or what? 
So it's possible that the um, the guard at the at the gate will have seen them approach from the wrong direction, um, or alternatively, yes, um, local residents uh, report it and and uh, make us aware of it, and then we investigate immediately. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. Are you any more questions? No, don't see any more. Uh, right, thank you, Mr. Wheeler and Mr. Uh, Schmeider. You can both uh, leave the meeting now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, members. Thank, thank you. And now we move on to questions for officers. Are there any questions for the officers? Councillor, Councillor Bailey, you have a question. Thank you, Kavina. Um, two questions, but they're closely related. Am I OK to go ahead with both, Kavina? Yes, you are. Great, thank you. Um, first of all, um, am I right in understanding that allegations about the previous conducts of the applicant or the previous applicant, for that matter, aren't material in this forum? And then second question is also that matters related to any neighbouring application are also not material for us today and that those have to be considered independently on their own merits. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, would you like to answer that? You're on mute. Sorry if you couldn't quite hear me there. My my mistake. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Bailey. And in short, the answer is no. Uh, not material consideration uh, and the allegations in relation to previous parties involved in the site uh, are not considerations for this application. Thank you. Councillor Lillingworth, you have a question. Uh, it, it's about the maintenance of the screening. Is it possible to put a condition in for longer term maintenance of the screening uh, as an additional condition? Mr. Smith again is going to answer that one. Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Ellingworth. I think it was uh, there. The condition already included in the report requires maintenance uh, of the landscaping. I think the confusion perhaps from, I think it was Mr. Galloway making uh, the, the deputation earlier was he is reading the five years where there is a period of initial uh, assessment of the establishment of the landscaping. So if, for example, some trees or bushes, uh, etc., were planted into the ground but did not establish themselves, then it's explicit that they would require to be replaced. Uh, but the condition requires that the landscaping is maintained. Thank you. Councillor McLaren, do you have a question? Yes, my question is um, with relation to my comments about the noise. Is it um, a consideration that there would be a condition attached to have uh, records of noise readings over in a reg over a regular basis? Mr. Smith. Thank you, Councillor. I think Lynn will come in, in in due course, but I'll maybe just first of all clarify that there has been a noise assessment. The noise assessment follows a, an agreed methodology that looks at various scenarios, uh, just covering off some of the points that, that you made, uh, and we are comfortable that the design specification will fall within acceptable levels. The conditions are applied as, I suppose, to an extent, belt and braces, should some unforeseen circumstance arise where we would then need to, to investigate that. So it's a fairly robust uh, approach that we're taking, but I'll maybe defer to, to Lynn Reid from our Environmental Health Service, who's uh, more qualified than I. Thank you. Yes, Councillor McLaren, um, to answer your question, um, when the, the applicant has to undertake a noise impact assessment, um, which we ask for with regards to BS4142, within that there is step 
um, standards and that they have to take into account with regards to weather and wind speed, and they should measure the wind speed and the weather at the site um, prior to monitoring. Um, so that is all taken into consideration. The conditions that we have set are through the outcome of the noise impact assessment to ensure that the residential amenity at the closest residential property will not be affected. We also have a condition with regards to the in light of complaints, and this could be because through time there's wear and tear on the equipment and you know, and there might be maintenance required. So if there is a, a, a justified complaint, then the applicant has to reassess the noise at that time and then any mitigation measures that they have to put in place from the outcome of that further noise impact assessment they will have to undertake to ensure that the residential amenity will be complied with and the conditions for the two noise conditions that we have set, the NR curves and the one set through the BS4142 outcome um, are complied with at all times. I hope that's answered your question. Councillor Williamson, you have a question? Sorry, convener. I wasn't quite ready for that. Uh, yeah, I'd like to go return to uh, the site being made safe in, in return um, in response to uh, either excessive surface water or uh, potential flooding. Um, uh, Christian suggested he may be able to answer that question. Yes, that, thank you, convener. I think uh, if you go to the, the report, uh, particularly before you, and I think paragraphs 51 to 53 from memory, uh, or was that noise? Paragraph 59 uh, of the report, um, which sets out the situation in relation to drainage and flooding. And, and in short, there are no parts of the site which are within function, uh, functional floodplain uh, and at obvious risk of flooding equally the design which has been undertaken uh, does not see any concerns related in terms of how surface water would affect the development so there are no objections from either our own structures and flooding team or CEPA. Possible to come back? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you Christian. I think I, my, my question is, is that whilst point 59 suggests that there, there are no flooding risks further down the report, it suggests there is a, a potential flooding risk because of a one in 200 year flood. So um, one of those states, statements might not be right. Can you direct me to the, the other part further down? I can maybe review that and clarify it. It's about, uh, it's in, in within one of the conditions that's been attached. Uh, I'm sorry. Is it condition 14? Yeah, 14, thank you. Yeah, and, and, and that reads for the avoidance of doubt, doubt. So that is part of this parts of the site, but not parts which are being developed. So it's a much as again reverting back to my presentation. The site is much larger than the area uh, which is being developed. Uh, and what this is doing is reminding that those areas should not be developed. So it's a belt and braces. Uh, approach. Uh, it's if there are any uh, works undertaken in relation to landscaping or or, or bonding, uh, etc., that they should be uh, removed from that area. So there's not any risk associated to the operational aspects. And this is just a reminder uh, that there are other areas of site that they're not proposing, obviously, to do anything, uh, but reminding them that if there was to be anything. Uh, done there that there, there are considerations to be given. Does that answer your you. question? It, it, yeah, yes, it, yes, it does. But um, it, it seems to me that the site is actually sat on a high, high water table and the potential risk, especially particularly in a flash flood. There would be, uh, I assume, excessive surface water. Um, Maybe comfort can be given by the fact that we consulted with uh, structures and flooding uh, and SEPA on the previous applications and they had no concerns in that regard. Thank you. 
Uh, is there any more questions for officers? No, nothing at all. OK, then we move to ask for a motion. Uh, I would like to bring forward this motion. Uh, just two real points about it. the energy security is a well talked about uh, subject right now. This application um, helps to secure our energy uh, requirements in the future. Uh, the, the applicant has uh, mitigated the noise and uh, the, the aesthetics of the, the plant and also help this, this plant will help to uh, reduce our uh, emissions and help reach our net zero target. Do you have a seconder? Oh, I do have a seconder. Uh, seconder, uh, Councillor Illingworth. Yeah, I'm content to second the motion uh, and I'm content that the planning officers uh, have performed their, their tasks uh, in accordance with the, the normal process. I don't normally come at this stage, councillors, but just to be clear, um, for clarity and for future purposes, I think your grant look, looking, uh, Councillor Mass and Councillor Lewis, looking to grant subject to the amended conditions. If you remember, that's the important bit. Remember that there were this circulation beforehand, so it's moving the report with the amendment. Yeah, thank you for that, Clive. Are there any amendments? No. Nope. The what uh, granted then. Okay. Oh. Yes, yes, you can. Yeah. Two minutes, John. Convener, for those of us online, I, I didn't hear the last. Are we in recess or something? I'm having a two minute comfort break. Oh, thank you very much. OK, we couldn't hear online. So Sorry. We need to use the mic. Thank you.
Is everybody back in the room? Councillor James? Councillor James, are you back with us? Oh, is that everyone back now? Yeah. Thank you. So we now move on to the next application, uh, which is an S42 application to remove condition 14, Bus Shelter and Information Board of Planning Permissions 1802-021139, land at 37 Angus Road, Schoon. Uh, I'll now ask, uh, hopefully, uh, Sean Panton to introduce the report. Yes, it's me this time. Um, so thank you, convener, and good morning, councillors. Firstly, like Mr Smith, I would like to extend my welcome to all new members on this newly branded Planning and Placemaking Committee. I would also like to welcome back our returning members. Turning to the application itself now, this is a Section 42 application to remove Condition 14 of Planning Permission 18 forward slash 02139 forward slash FLM which was for the redevelopment of the former Wheel In site in Schoon. For the benefit of the new councillors on this committee, a Section 42 application is only to amend or delete a condition that has already been applied to a planning permission. A Section 42 application does not amend the previous decision other than the condition under question. In this instance, it is sought to delete Condition 14, which required the developer to provide a bus shelter at an existing bus stop. The developer originally applied for a bus shelter on Angus Road, but the public transport unit considered this was not necessary due to the provision of shelters already on Angus Road. The public transport unit therefore requested that the shelter was located an, at an existing bus stop on Stormont Road outside the Schoon Surgery. The developer has assessed this and has advised that due to land ownership constraints, it has not been possible to obtain the land required to provide the shelter. The Council's transport planning team, who have a representative here today to answer any questions which you may have, have confirmed that they have no objection to the proposed deletion of the condition. Next slide, please. This first slide shows the location of the development under question. The site is the former Wheel Inn in Schoon located just off Angus Road on almost the corner with Stormont Road. The redevelopment itself is now needing completion. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed site plan as granted under the original permission. The yellow star on the plan indicates where the proposed bus shelter was to be located. Please note that there is already a bus stop in this location, just not a bus stop shelter. The white area immediately to the south of the yellow star between Stormont Road and the site is the Schoon Surgery. It is understood that Schoon Surgery own the land where the bus shelter is to be located, thus being out with the developer's control. Next slide, please. This Google Street View image shows the bus stop under question on Stormont Road, denoted by the red arrow. The blue arrow shows the development itself. As seen from this photograph, Due to the narrowness of the pavement, the only location for a bus shelter would be within the grounds of Schoon Surgery. As previously stated, the developer has indicated it has not been possible to secure this land, hence the current application to remove the condition. Next slide, please. Thank you, convener. That concludes the presentation for this application. I will leave members with the proposed site plan again.
Um, thank you, Mr. Pant. And just uh, there's a technical issue that's arisen. Just want to clarify, is Colin Elliott legal here? Um, I'm aware that one member was having some difficulties with sound at this, uh, doing that presentation. Councillor James, um, are you able to continue or and, and vote on this matter? Um, was your connection secure enough? Um, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, my head, I had a yes. fault with the headset. Um, I, I think um, I, I didn't miss too much, to be honest, Mr. Elliott. So I, I'm quite happy to go ahead with um, any decision making. As long as it was only a few seconds and you, yep. you know, have followed the stills and heard everything, everything appropriate, that would be, uh, you can continue. I, I could actually see all this. I could see the presentation. Just yes. uh, missed okay. it. Just okay. Just one Okay, thank you. Uh, I now we have a deputation, uh, so I'll now invite Councillor Colin Stewart, uh, a local mem member, uh, to make a deputation. Uh, I'll hand over to the vice convener uh, to tell you the procedure, which I'm sure you know. Good morning, Councillor Stewart. I'm aware that you um, know the procedures, so would you like me just to start timing you when you start your deputation? And thank you, Councillor Stewart. Um, <coughs> uh, thank you, convener, vice convener, and members uh, for. Um, uh, entertaining uh, a deputation from me um, this morning. I think the first thing um, to establish um, in connection with uh, this application is that, as noted in the report, um, uh, and as Mr Panton was referring to, there are land ownership constraints, but the biggest constraint is likely to be if the applicant has not approached screen surgery um, for uh, permission um, to uh, seek to site the um, conditioned bus shelter on their land. Um, I know that that's the case um, as I uh, confirmed this with the surgery on Friday. Um, <clears throat> now, the um, whole development um, was originally for uh, um, private sale with um, what, um, an element of uh, affordable housing in that. Um, but now that the whole development is going to be affordable housing through um, the uh, Kingdom Housing Association um, and that the age bracket um, stipulation for residents of 55 year old plus um, is still in place, it is more likely that there will be more people looking to use uh, public transport in the area. Um, I have been on site myself and I had thought that a three bay cantilever structure might be able to be situated directly behind the existing stop um, with a requirement for no more than approximately a six inch strip of land. Um, I checked with public transport unit and uh, that might require putting the shelter over a dropped curb. Um, I think you saw in the image the, um, uh, the uh, tan coloured bubbled um, uh, paving where the dropped curb is, um, or blocking the existing path from the surgery door to the stop, uh, to the bus stop, the existing bus stop, uh, thus meaning that the path would need to be realigned. However, that stop um, will generally only serve people heading um, along Stormont Road and into Spoutwell's area on the number seven bus. It effectively forms um, a loop and comes back along Stormont Road past the surgery. So there's a, you know, a, a, a five minute loop there. On the opposite side of the road, however, there is another stop which has no shelter and is also on a narrow pavement. At that stop, however, could be moved approximately 20 to 30 metres west along um, Stormont Road. Um, it could be set back from the pavement on new hard standing on top of what is currently only a um, grassed area at the bottom of what is known locally as the Bleachy. That stop on the opposite side of the road could then serve passengers going up to the park and ride and then on into town. And it would be likely to have far more passengers stopping to wait at it, and thus more people needing um, some shelter from the elements um, while using public transport. While I'm not sure whether the committee could demand that that particular solution is adopted, um, were you to uphold the original condition by refusing this application, it would open the way to a discussion between the developer, the public transport unit, um, and the Community Council 
um, the bus company and any other interested parties, and it would be a quicker solution to implement. On the basis of a brief conversation I've had with the Public Transport Unit and also with a representative of the Community Council, um, they have both given early indicative support for that idea. Um, I realise that you have to take into consideration uh, material considerations during the planning process, but I would say that I think that all of us do have a general duty um, to uphold um, confidence in the planning system and that that is likely to be undermined if major developments uh, can seek to waive conditions, especially at such a late stage of development before sale or occupation of the properties. Um, returning to the condition in particular, um, while the report may be correct that waiving the condition um, as proposed would not reduce the demand for public transport, the flip side of that coin is that putting in place better infrastructure might encourage more people to use public transport. And in this respect, improving the infrastructure by upholding the condition would support the need for sustainable development and respect the pressing need that all of us have to address the problems of climate change. And I urge the committee to um, reject the application and uphold the condition. Uh, thank you, Councillor Stewart. Uh, are there any questions from members for Councillor Stewart? Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Convener, um, and apologies, Councillor Stewart, for asking you a question while facing my back to you, but it's an impossible situation. Um, regarding the, the proposal, you mentioned that a bus stop could be located on the opposite side of the road, so the north side of Stormont Road. Um, I need a little help with how the bus service is oriented. Um, would that mean that a person, if they were to catch the bus that side, would need to travel north a little way, wait for the next bus that would come and then take them past the stop they just got on at, or would the idea be more rather that they would shelter on one side of the road, then nip across when they see the bus coming? Just a bit of help because I can't see much need for northbound traffic on the bus from that direction. Thank you. Um, if, if you if you put a bus stop on the um, north side, uh, sorry, there is a bus stop on the north side, so it would be potentially to relocate it, but include the shelter, which does not exist on either side of the road at the moment. Um, those, the, the bus from that location turns, um, comes out of Storm Road, turns left up um, Angus Road, goes into the park and ride, and then um, carries on back down Angus Road through the centre of Schoon and into town. Um, if you were to seek to just get on a, a bus that was going directly into town without doing the loop up to the park and ride, then you would um, be needing to um, walk further um, down into the centre to a safe crossing point to find a, a, a bus stop um, in the centre of Schoon. So um, effectively you're saving um, the, 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 the walk out and down and across Angus Road at any point, um, by, but you're just essentially getting on the bus going up Angus Road to the park and ride and coming back down Angus Road a couple of minutes. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? No, we don't seem to have any more questions. Uh, thank you for your deputation, Councillor Stewart. Uh, you're free to go. Thank you. Now we move on to questions for officers. Do we have any questions for officers? Councillor Braun. Thank you, Convener. Um, a question regarding the shelter. The original condition was um, for a bus shelter. There was no specific location for it. Um, I know um, some of the objectors have mentioned Angus Road, and I know we're saying there are other bus shelters. This, this bus shelter could be conditioned. Uh, mentions an information board. Was that going to be a digital information board? Uh, and if so, do any of the other bus shelters on the Angus Road have that sort of facility? Somebody want to answer that one? John? Yes. Yes, I can answer that one, Councillor Braun. 
Um, so the wording of the condition didn't require a digital information board. It's just an information board that clearly conveys the times of the buses and the likes. Um, so it didn't have to be digital. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bailey's next in my chat. Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, with regard to the width of the pavement, I think I could show a couple of locations in my ward where bus stops, sorry, bus shelters specifically occupy narrower pavements. Is this a case of grandfather rights, as in the council wouldn't ever remove those bus shelters because people have become accustomed to them? But when we're placing a new one, we have a higher bar to adhere to with regard to ensuring people can access the shelter and still access the pavement once the shelter is installed. Thank you. Hey, Lachlan, I believe you're going to answer that one. Thank you for the, the question, Councillor Bailey. Yes, um, where we um, have um, shelters that have previously been installed, um, we wouldn't remove them um, from the, the network. But where we're installing new shelters, um, we want to make sure that we're adhering to the current um, standards that are there um, to ensure that people with any, any disabilities um, can freely pass the shelters um, and not have to, for argument's sake, um, if the footway was too narrow, um, they might have to go onto the road carriageway to pass it, um, which isn't an ideal situation. Um, and that would be the situation um, with the shelter being located within the footway here. Um, so that's why um, in its current situation, um, just on the footway, um, it, it would narrow down the footway too much. Thank you. Answer your question, Councillor Bailey. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Anderson, do you have a question? Yes, I felt in the report mentions that um, the park and ride is a short walk away. It's more than a short walk away up to park and ride from that location. I feel it is an essential. We have a shelter in that area. One could possibly have it maybe about 50 yards up Angus Road beyond Junction Stormont Road. There's quite a wide pavement there. If that was a location, it could be approved. I don't object to it. Uh, Colin said with regards to crossing the road to the north side of the road in Stormont Road, it's another good location. But it's essential we have one in that area and not consider the one Council that Anderson, park and ride please. is over the top. Well. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. We have to be careful not to get into too many statements, which should be a question, but maybe appropriate to ask Mr Lachlan McLean, I think it would be Lachlan, either Sean Panton or Lachlan McLean, to comment on how this has come about and I appreciate other locations have been suggested if you could address that as well. Yeah, I'll just take the, the lead there first, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, so one thing that I would need to make clear that to the committee, when we are applying conditions to a planning consent, they have to meet the conditions test. And one of the tests is, is the land within the ownership um, and is it a deliverable condition? Now, whilst I fully appreciate there are other locations on Angus Road, Stormont Road and further afield in Schoon that could benefit from a shelter, we need to be, we need to be satisfied that the conditions test is met and that the owner of the land we can make it deliverable. Now when the condition was originally applied to the original permission it was understood that this land was within the applicant's ownership so they could deliver it. It has now come to light that it is not within the applicant's ownership so the condition now fails to meet the conditions test. So if we are looking at putting a um, bus stop elsewhere in Schoon, we have to bear in mind it wouldn't meet a conditions test because it's not within the um, applicant's control. Um, Lachlan can maybe comment further on the, the points regarding the park and ride. Thanks, Sean. Um, with regards to the location of the, the nearest bus stop um, with a shelter, um, if we were to travel um, from the, the vehicle access um, from um, Angus Road itself and travel northwards um, for 140 metres or so, um, we will come to a southbound um, bus stop um, with a shelter that's already located there. Um, so within vicinity of the um, development itself, um, we do have um, a bus stop um, with a shelter, um, albeit it's not the one directly outside um, the, the development at Stormont Road, um, just to the north on Angus Road, there is one as we travel southbound there. Does that answer your question, Councillor Anderson? 
yeah, it's a bit of a climb. Councillor Langworth, you've got a question. Yeah. If we were to refuse this application, um, is the proposal or the scheme uh, from Councillor Colin Stewart possible? John, you're going to answer that one. Yes, yeah, so if this application was refused today, it would be up to the applicant to submit a scheme to us that we're in agreement with um, for a bus shelter and information board somewhere in vicinity of the site. Now, we do run the risk that we refuse it today and the applicant has absolutely no control over any of the footways and can't get any um, land ownership rights and then they can't comply with the condition and we have a we have a breach of planning control um, which would be have to we would have to deal with that and that would put us as a council in an awkward position because we've applied a condition that the developer is trying to comply with and they cannot and we would then have to take action upon them. So just to supplement Mr Planton saying uh, it's beyond that as well of course if you refuse that there's a possibility the developer could appeal that particular decision now that's a technical option available to them. Kristen, you want to add to this? You're on mute, Kristen. Again, apologies. Uh, still getting used to this new committee. Uh, there are a number of technical issues here to consider, and I think what and Sean alluded to it a little bit, there are six tests which conditions require to, to be able to pass, uh, and one of those is that the reduction in infrastructure is a direct result uh, of the development in itself. Uh, and I think the wider issue of shelters associated to bus stops in Schoon is not as a result necessarily of this development in itself. So that wider existing infrastructure deficit, if there was a deficit, uh, should not necessarily be addressed by this development. We had taken the opportunity uh, to have something immediately adjacent uh, to this uh, site and development as a, a positive addition to the bus network. Uh, I would urge caution uh, in opening it up to a much wider consideration uh, and would uh, have doubts whether or not that would be uh, something that would stand the test of any appeal at the minute as well. And I think Mr Panton uh, covered it as well. The understanding uh, at the point of applying the condition for this location uh, or the immediacy was that the land was under the control of the applicant. That is subsequently found not to be the case. Therefore, and again, Mr Elliott may step in to clarify uh, the ability to enforce this condition, another one of the tests uh, associated uh, to the, the, the circular related to conditions is not there. Uh, so to an extent it could be if there are no other reasonable uh, alternatives which have been investigated as my understanding via the, the transportation team in conjunction with speaking to the public transport unit and perhaps Mr McLean can, can comment further on that. Uh, but the condition as it stands uh, is perhaps not uh, able to be enforced, therefore is not lawful. Uh, and without an alternative being obvious that we'd be able to be tied to the development itself. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't appear that there is uh, another option for us. I could come in, members. Uh, Mr Christian uh, Smith is quite correct. First, uh, there are various tests for conditions and I appreciate we are uh, on some real uh, legalities about conditions here. But it does have to fairly and reasonably relate to the development. So, in other words, it wouldn't be a shelter anywhere within Scoon that has to relate to the development. Uh, it also has to be deliverable, which Mr. Smith, Mr. Panton is mentioning. And I think it'd be fair to say, well, deliverable in the sense of um, it has to be within the control of the applicant to provide it, as either they own it or in some way the council can assist in providing that. I don't mean buying land, it would be something the council already controls a bit of land. So it has to be enforceable, and that's the problem here. It's not enforceable when the developer doesn't own the land. And I think it's fair to say that um, now we know that information, uh, where we are now, um, it's fair to say that the planners would not have recommended that condition originally. Mr. 
Mr McLean has any to add. Sorry, I'm not near enough to the microphone. I may not be picking up. Thanks, Mr. Colin. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I've got any further um, information to add at the moment. Um, I, th I think, um, as Christian and everyone else has said, that if we were to look for um, the site over the road, for argument's sake, um, I'm not sure that we have title um, of that land or have control of the land. Um, now, that's a risk um, that we would need to explore, um, and I think we need to explore that in more detail. But as I currently start, uh, as, as my current understanding is, we don't have ownership of the, the land over the road. I could be wrong, um, but that would be something that we would have to explore in a bit more detail. Councillor Brown, you've got a question. Yep, thank you, Convener. I'm just following on for this, for what Mr Elliott has said. Um, going back to this question about the bus shelter in Angus Road, um, presumably the pavement on which that stands belongs to the council. Would, would that be not optimum? clarify that point if that land is owned by us that could be a possible uh, or am i missing the point sean do you want to i think lachlan can cover that actually yeah. it's been looked at yes Thanks, Christian. Um, in terms of if it's part of the adopted um, road network, um, we we should we can install a shelter on the footway um, within that location, provided there is enough um, space for us to do that in terms of the width of the footway and things like that. Um, I think in in terms of the originally proposed location, which was um, directly outside the vehicle access on Angus Road, um, it, it was felt that to have the shelter um, right outside the um, the development site was over provision in terms of the bus stops we already have on Angus. Road and that's why we went round um, at, at Stormont Road there. Um, so I think if we are looking for an alternative location on Angus Road, um, I think we need to be mindful of that fact um, and also the fact that we do have a bus shelter um, within 140 metres um, of the development site already for anyone who would be travelling southbound. Christian, you want to add something to that? Yeah, just maybe to add to that. My understanding is that the, the location on Angus Road was looked at by transport colleagues and dismissed. Uh, and maybe just to clarify as well that the established uh, acceptable distance uh, from development to uh, bus stops is 400 metres. And I think it was mentioned earlier that there is a bus stop uh, very close, a number of bus stops very close, but a bus stop with a shelter uh, around about 120 metres away. Uh, I might be wrong on that exact distance, uh, but well within the established um, guidance distances of 400 metres. Are there any more questions for officers? No, no. Uh, can I suggest that we defer this item uh, on the grounds of uh, that we require more information and the possibility of looking for another location for the bus shelter? I agree that. Second, can I have a seconder for that? Is that agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Members, can I suggest that it would be to fair for more information on the location and deliverability of a possible bus shelter? Yes. Uh, members, uh, we move, can we move on to the next uh, application? Uh, it's application 21 slash 00248 slash FLL, erection of a retail unit class one, formation of access, car parking, 
engineering works, landscaping and associated works land west of four Thicker Bairn Petivalis Perth. Uh, can I ask Mr Paul Williamson to speak to the report? That's actually myself that will cover that one convener. Um, so I'll just take it from here. Thank you. Sorry, Paul, if you've got a, a bit of a fright there. And uh, so again, firstly, I'll again uh, say to members that of the committee that we've received an update uh, circulation sent to you all that allows for a wider scope of legal mechanisms to remove the ability of the existing Aldi premises uh, at Glasgow Road to be used for class one retail purposes. Uh, there is also some wording revisions to condition three, four, seven, uh, nine, ten and fifteen. Again, I hope that this is all self-explanatory in the circulation. It's asked that these amendments are included as part of the decision making today, superseding the version in the published report. Um, so thank you, convener. Uh, this application proposes to develop a new and slightly larger Aldi store off necessity Bray, with the existing Aldi store to be closed and the ability for it to be used as a retail premises removed. The site uh, under consideration is currently allocated for employment purposes, but excluding retail use of this scale. As such, the proposal are a departure from the terms of the Perth and Kinross Local Development Plan. However, it's considered that there are material considerations which justify approval of the application as set out in the report, and these include acceptance that the existing site cannot accommodate the expanded offering, that no other sequentially preferable sites are available, and that the existing premises will see its ability to be used for class one retail purposes legally removed. Uh, I'll now move to a presentation to outline the detail and context of the proposals. So firstly, we have an aerial photo and this image uh, identifies the location south of Necessity Bray and just off Glasgow Road. Uh, with low road and allotments to the east and the Aviva grounds to the west and south, the inset showing more detail. Next slide, please. We now see the proposed layout of the development with the store position, parking, service area, access points and areas of landscaping all shown. The closest residential properties on low road are also evident to the left side, at uh, the right side, sorry. Next slide, please. This slide sees three sections through the site running east to west, evidencing the ground levels which would result from the reprofiling works proposed. As can be seen, the building has been kept away from the properties on the low road, and although ground levels are raised, the parking area is contained by a parapet wall with a graded and landscape zone then to the rear of those low road properties. Next slide, please. Here is a rendition to show the likely appearance of the completed development and its surroundings, looking from above and looking from close to the junction with Glasgow Road. The image uh, taking you from left takes us from the low roadside across the landscape slope to the parapet and car parking, then to the store with the service area to the rear, then the junction with the road to Aviva uh, opposite the flats on Kim and Drive and Aviva can be seen in the right of shot at a higher level. Next slide, please. The second rendition shows the likely appearance from the junction with Glasgow Road. This time at level we may experience either walking or in a car. Next slide, please. So we now move to a series of recent photographs which seek to give a feel for the current situation. The first photo is taken from below the Glasgow Road Junction, uh, which we saw in the previous rendition with the low road to the left and necessity Bray veering right. The existing access to the site is via the Aviva site further up necessity Brain Bray, while the new access is to be formed where the brick wall is. Uh, a new pedestrian crossing is to be provided in an agreed location likely along this frontage. Next photo, please. Here we look uh, from within the site east and into the remainder of the site from the existing access road from the west within the Aviva. Uh, the proposed Aldi will be off to the right, car parking with a new access to the left. Next photo, please. 
now have a view in roughly a southerly direction towards Aviva, which sits in an elevated position, uh, but obscured by that tree in the centre of shot. Next photo, please. This looks again from within the site towards Necessity Bray this time to roughly where the new access would be formed. Last photo, please. So finally, we look towards the east site boundary with the residential properties on low road visible uh, beyond the trees. The car parking would be in the foreground with proposed landscaping concentrated in the area beyond. Thank you, convener. That now con uh, concludes the presentation for this application we return to one of the renditions of how the completed development would appear. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, we now move on to deputations there. We've got one from, it's a change, it's not Mr. Stephen Robb, it's uh, actually Mr. Philip Johnson. Do we have Mr. Philip Johnson on the line? Yeah. Hello, Mr. Johnson, can you hear me? Morning. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll now hand you over to the deputy convener who will run you through the procedures for your deputation, okay? Thank you. Good morning. Um, so good morning. Johnson. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Can you hear me OK? I can, yes. Um, thank you for your deputation. Uh, hopefully you'll be aware that you've got up to 10 minutes to talk. On nine minutes, I will give you a warning and I'll allow you to have a summary. Uh, I will start the timer uh, once you start talking and, and just proceed in your own time. Great, thank you very much. So good morning all, and thank you for giving us the time to speak today. Uh, my name is Philip Johnson. I'm the property director at Aldi. My role involves the acquiring, designing, building and maintenance of our stores throughout Scotland. Uh, I am joined here by Stephen Robb, who is our planning um, consultant from Avis and Young. Uh, Stephen won't speak to the application, but is available uh, with myself at the end for any questions that, that you may have. Before I comment on the finer details of the application before you, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about me, because I think it speaks to the intent and the commitment behind the contents of the proposals that are in front of you. The application before you isn't from a developer seeking to throw up a building and sell it on to the next person. This is an owner operator who is heavily investing in a building that needs to be right now and for the next 20 plus years. The person behind that is me, a person born and bred in Perth, lives in Schoon, whose mum worked at General Accident for over 30 years from the day it opened its door, and also my grandmother who worked in the residences that are now demolished. This means that my knowledge of the site is incredibly intimate. And for me, this isn't just a site, this is my local store, a lasting impression of my town for all who I care about to see. I need to get this right, and getting it right is the heartbeat behind the content of what you see today. It is therefore extremely pleasing to have received the recommendation for approval, for which I'm most grateful. And I think this is testament to the efforts and passions of all parties that were involved in the application to make it as good as it can possibly be. The reason for the application in the first instance is that the store on Glasgow Road is problematic for Aldi. It is far smaller than our standard store. And of the 102 stores serviced in Scotland today, there are only three remaining of this size. The product range that we have struggles to fit into the current store. And with a train line to the east, a bridge to the south and buildings on the north and west, a suitable extension has proved impossible. This means that we have an option to either close the store or to relocate it. Perth is a good market. It has massive growth ambitions. And it's clear that investing heavily and relocating to a fit for purpose site is the way forward for our business. The site at Necessity Bray offers Aldi the ability to achieve all of our portfolio objectives. That is a sales score of 1,315 square metres, standard parking numbers and servicing an expanding settlement which currently has limited provision. This is the only site we found capable of delivering on all our needs and so an application was pursued. When promoting Aldi's applications, it's a view to take a proactive approach to consultation and this site was no different. We're not required to undertake public consultations as this is not a major application. However, it is my view that if we want people to shop in our store, the best way to do that is by building something that they themselves want to visit. To achieve this, we need to listen to and take on board any thoughts, observations or concerns that local people may have. COVID-19 severely limited the ability to hold in-person consultations. However, an online Zoom consultation was held 
an interactive website was available, and over 2,000 invitations for feedback were posted to nearby residents. We also held separate consultation for the people living closest to the development to focus on their views. This culminated in 250 pieces of individual feedback, of which around two thirds were in support of the proposals. Comments were taken on board and they were implemented at the same time as responses from officers and certain consultees. The result, I believe, is a well-rounded proposal. The appearance of the building is very sympathetic to the surroundings and with the green roof and timber cladding, it's worth noting on the CGI how the building ties into the sports centre behind. Great effort went into blending the scheme into Bucky Brays, where the existing tree mix is replicated and sweeps through the site to give the impression of it being a natural extension to the area. The open field will remain as there will be no fencing around the site to separate it from the woodland areas as is. There are currently 96 trees on the site. However, I think it's worth noting that only two are classed as mature trees and only 16 are of good enough quality to be classified as A specimens. 28 trees are in fact recommended for removal regardless of development due to them being infected. As well as the trees being of poor quality, so too is the biodiversity currently visible on site. The proposed landscaping consists of 102 native specimens, as well as a host of herbaceous planting and pollinators. Man-made interventions are also included, such as bat, bee and bird habitats. And for me, this is the most enhancing landscaping and biodiversity proposal I have ever put forward for a new location for Ralby. I also believe that there's a spatial reason for supporting this application. The southwestern quarter of Perth currently has no food retail offering. This is an area of recent and future growth. For those living in Charlotte Gate, as an example, the nearest store is Lidl 1.7 miles east or Tesco 2.7 miles north. In this area, there's a dense settlement that if the application is approved, will now have local access to food retailing. There are further reasons for support contained within the officer's report, which uh, I shall not cover here. Should the application be approved, I hope to start light construction works in early 2023, with the store opening in the first quarter of 2024. The current store on Glasgow Road would cease trading the night prior to the new store opening. In recent weeks, a sale of the existing store has already been provisionally agreed on the basis that has already been outlined that there will be no retail consent at that current location. Thank you for your time and again, the opportunity to, to add some points to the application. Both myself and Steve would welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I'll hand you back to the convener. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Mr Johnson or Mr Rob? Councillors. <laughs> Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, convener, and thank you, Mr. Johnson, for your enthusiastic presentation. Um, and uh, I, I simply had one question, which I think you answered uh, in in your final question, your final comments. But I just wanted to be completely clear. Um, it's in relation to the Glasgow Road site uh, and your intentions in that regard. Did you say, or did I mishear, uh, that? Uh, a sale subject to the, this planning permission going ahead uh, and the uh, related revocation of retail um, um, planning permission for, for the existing Glasgow Road site. Did you say that a sale has been agreed uh, subject to that, uh, subject to the decision of the committee today, or is it not quite as cut and dried as that? Thanks. My view of our existing um, location is that it sits within a semi-industrial area which would be of interest to a great number of, of occupiers. We have not marketed our premises yet because I think that would be premature of, of any decision today and, and other works that we need to do. However, knowing that the application was before yourselves today, we have had people contact us with regards to purchasing it as an investment. Um, in principle, uh, one of those has been accepted and that potential uh, purchaser is fully abreast of the fact that the store will not have class one retail consent available to it. 
and any subsequent planning uh, application would have to be put forward for whatever use they would be looking to use it for. So in answer to your question, yes, we have in principle agreed uh, a sale so that when we close the store the night before opening Necessity Braid, should this be approved, then there is someone already lined up to immediately purchase uh, and invest in that current location. Thank you for your answer. I'll have a subsequent question for officers, but thank you for your answer. Are there any more questions for Mr. Johnson or Mr. Rob? No? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Johnson, for your presentation. Uh, you're free to go now. You can come off the line. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for officers, members? <laughs> Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Kavina. I've got two separate questions. Uh, may I address them separately? Is that okay? Yes. Thank yeah. you. The first one is about Chapter 45 of the report. Um, it stated that um, a viability appraisal has been completed, which further identifies that development of the site for office industrial or hotel use would not be viable due to significant abnormal development costs. Can I ask, please, um, who conducted that viability appraisal and who paid for that viability appraisal? Thank you. Christian. Yeah, sorry, so slight little delay there and me getting my A into the box and making sure that my microphone was actually on this time. Uh, that appraisal has been undertaken uh, and I think that the report is within the file uh, online uh, and submitted in relation to, to this application uh, and it's been reviewed and commented on by our economic development team uh, who accept that there are significant costs associated to to developing this site. I think another part that, that we should be aware of, this site has been allocated for those purposes and indeed has had planning permission uh, for alternative employment purposes for many, many years uh, and has seen no development coming forward uh, on that basis, which is, to my view, reflective uh, of the costs of developing this site. Uh, the costs in themselves perhaps evidenced as well by the significant uh, groundworks etc required in order to, to platform this site uh, provide a new access etc etc so we are comfortable uh, with that approach uh, that there are significant questions over the viability uh, for alternative uses as per the allocation. Sorry, could I follow up, please, convener? Um, my question was specifically who carried out the report and who paid for the report. Thank you. If that information is known. I don't have that information to hand. I would have to go away, review the file and uh, see who the offer was. Uh, and I don't think I would have uh, the ability to determine who paid for it or, or otherwise. Uh, not that that who, who's undertaken the work and or who paid for it is, is not a planning consideration. So I've not appraised myself of that. I'm sorry. It is information submitted by the applicant. That's what I'm looking to reach. Yeah, there is information submitted by the applicant, which has been reviewed by our uh, economic development colleagues who accept the outcomes therein. OK, thank you. The second question. Yeah, thank you very much. My second question is about paragraph 51 in the report, where there is the observation that if this was approved, it would account for only a 0.5% loss of overall employment land allocation in the Perth core. Um, I find that, you know, I won't make a statement. Um, why is that brought forward when I've not, I've looked at other applications where we've been speaking about the loss of prime agricultural land, for example, and I've never seen this um, comparison drawn. We're not informed in those cases what the net loss of prime agricultural land would be from in, from approving an individual house. Yet in this case, we're being informed of the, um, we're being given an opinion on the amount of 
um, the amount of employment land that's being lost from this application. Just wondering why that's material in this case, but isn't mentioned in other applications where a, a, a class of land will be lost. Thank you. Kristen again, thank you. Yeah, m m maybe trying to give a, a fairly concise answer to, to that. The council is required to maintain a supply of this sort of land. Therefore, uh, this is demonstrating the impacts in relation to that requirement to maintain that supply, uh, which is a, a statutory requirement and indicating that there is not an issue in that regard. There is not the same uh, statutory requirement to maintain uh, a specified supply of agricultural land. So the two approaches are different under law. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Drysdale, you have a question? Thank you, convener. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I do. Uh, just in relation to uh, uh, my previous question to um, Mr Johnson uh, uh, and his presentation, and in relation to uh, the consequences for the existing Glasgow Road site, um, I, I wanted to ask, first of all, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see any conditions uh, relative to the Glasgow Road site um, being included within this I, and I wanted to ask whether it was uh, considered and whether indeed it is legally permissible uh, to condition this um, uh, this application uh, w with a requirement for uh, the sale uh, of uh, the uh, Glasgow Road site uh, to be concluded prior to commencement of the development uh, or opening of the development uh, at the new site. Yeah. I can come in on that. <clears throat> I, mean, I don't think that would be legal to put a condition in that way. What you have before you is that the report, if you grant it, it will be subject to a section 75 for contributions, but also there's to be the revocation of the existing consent to Glasgow Road to avoid it being retailed. Beyond that is more commercial decisions rather than a planning issue. So I don't think you could condition that um, because you don't, you couldn't guarantee when a sale would go through, what the end use would be, etc. I think that wouldn't be a reasonable planning condition. I don't know if Mr. Smith has any comment on that. Yes, but may, maybe just clarifying and, and making a comment on on what you've said there, Colin, as well. The, the issue here is the acceptability of the site uh, and the expanded retail offer relative to planning policy considerations. Uh, in relation to that, there is a position uh, and recommendation that the impacts on the city centre be mitigated through the removal of the ability to use the existing premises for retail purposes. That would be undertaken by a section five legal agreement or other legal mechanism, which was uh, the introduction uh, in relation to the addendum that was before you. In terms of a condition uh, to say uh, something shall not happen or the use shall not be concluded uh, until another property uh, in another location is sold uh, is not, in my view, uh, something that we can do or would be lawful. Uh, so that's not what's before you, but we have the comfort in place uh, that the decision here will not be issued until such time as there is a legal mechanism in place that would restrict the ability to uh, use this premise uh, only after the ability to use the Glasgow Road premises for retail purposes was removed. Uh, a follow up if I may convener. Yes, you may. So ju just to be clear then, there is nothing legally or practically that can be done to uh, prevent the uh, the possibility uh, of the Gla existing Glasgow road, road site being effectively another large empty retail unit in the city centre. I see you coming back on that. Uh, in general terms, no. Uh, but I think you know the comments that you've received there from, from Mr Johnston seem to indicate that despite there having been no marketing of those premises, that there is fairly strong interest in taking them on. Just to add to that, I think Mr Smith said it earlier on, but what we're concentrating on is this particular application. And of course, I know there's a link to the existing site, 
um, in terms of can it move up there in retail terms, um, but you're primarily looking at this site before you, not looking at the Glasgow Road site. But I appreciate where you're coming from, though. Thank you, and I appreciate what you're saying. I was just seeking to establish whether there is any legal way to prevent uh, that um, highly undesirable scenario. Thanks. Councillor Brown, you have a question. Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. Um, uh, Councillor Drysdale has answered, or I've got asked one already for me. So um, I've just got uh, it's just three, but they're all interlinked with transport. And, and, and the question really is uh, the access, the new access that's been built onto Necessity Bray, will that need to be controlled in any way because of the volume of traffic? Um, and if not, will there need to be any speed restrictions put in on Necessity Bray because of the volume of traffic coming out of that junction? The third part is when it gets to the junction with Necessity Bray and the uh, A93 Glasgow Road, which I think at the moment is just a mini roundabout, will that need to be changed to allow for the volume of traffic, which Aldi would almost certainly attract? Who's going to answer that one? Mr. McLean, I would think. Oh. <laughs> Mr. McLean's yeah. going to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, maybe we try and take them one at a time as well. I, I didn't get a chance to to write all three down in one, so you might have to repeat yourself, Councillor Braun, uh, but I'll, I'll let Laughlin go first. Thanks for the, the, the question, Councillor Braun. Um, the first aspect um, that, that you mentioned there was the, the vehicle access out onto um, Necessity Bray from the store itself. Um, it isn't proposed to signalise that and um, with the volume of traffic there and um, we don't feel that that's appropriate and that, uh, a simple giveaway junction would be appropriate there and um, for the, the, the vehicles um, egressing from the store and um, with regards to the um, necessity break glasgow road junction and um, that is signalised um, already at the moment so the mini roundabout that was there was taken out a number of years ago um, and, and that junction was signalised along with the oak bank road i think if, I'm, if i've got the right um, street name there and um, that area has all been signalised um, in terms of um, pedestrian access to the store, um, we are proposing um, that a pedestrian crossing, a signalised pedestrian crossing um, should be put in place um, to facilitate the movement um, from one side of the road to the other. Um, as um, the applicant um, mentioned, is there is quite a, a large um, housing development um, at Charlotte Gate there, um, so there's an opportunity for um, the, the residents there to, to use the store and walk to the store, so we want to make that as easy as possible for them. And I think your final point was regarding um, speed reduction measures um, or reducing the speed limit. Um, the speed limit um, in on uh, necessity break is already um, 30 miles an hour, as I can, as I understand it, and we wouldn't um, propose to lower that at this time. Thank you very much for that. And uh, you can tell I don't drive on Glasgow Road that much, but uh, thank you for your information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLaren, have you got another que a question? Yes, thank you. Yes, I do. It's with regard to the flooding. Um, as we all know, the area is prone to flooding. So what assurances can you give the committee that the, the development will not add to the um, existing flooding issues at Low Road and Cherry Bank? Is that for you, Kristen? Yeah, thank you, Councillor McLaren, for the question uh, and certainly something we've covered uh, a number of times uh, at this committee over the, the years in relation to flooding issues uh, along the, the routes of various water courses in this area. Uh, what I would say is that the, there are flood uh, surface water retention and mitigation measures designed into this proposal mm -hmm. uh, by and large uh, is associated to um, caged retention systems uh, that will see surface water uh, retained and then flow out at a controlled rate, uh, which would be equal to the greenfield site rate, so i.e. The, the designed runoff rate associated to the current situation. But beyond that, the design would also incorporate uh, a climate change scenario where there would be an enhanced level of retention. Uh, okay. So there shouldn't be any more water uh, than is currently the situation running off from the site. Uh, indeed, accounting for the, the climate change addition, uh, it may well be that less water and certainly water would be controlled in the way that it runs off, where at the minute it is uncontrolled. Uh, and some see, may see that as a significant betterment than the current situation. OK, uh, thank you. Could I ask another question? 
Yes, of course. Uh, it's more in relation to the public transport provision. Uh, the existing site on Glasgow Road has um, a, a strong uh, is serviced well by the public transport network, i.e. the buses. So would there be, you know, for the communities living a bit further away now to get to this new enhanced store, um, would, would there be an uplift in the public transport provision? Lachlan. Thank you. Thank you, convener. In, in terms of um, public transport uplift, at the moment it isn't proposed that there would be any uplift um, to the public transport that, that passes the site. Um, in terms of, um, th there are a number of providers um, that pass close by um, the store already. Um, we've got the service um, 9, um, which goes from um, North Muirton to Cherry Bank. Um, we've got the service 17 that comes from Octorarder to Perth. Um, we've also got the um, the number seven bus um, that we spoke about earlier that comes down from Schoon. Um, we've also got the, the number 19 um, that heads from Blackford into Perth itself. Um, and we've got another uh, other um, providers um, that, that pass the, the, the locality. Um, so in essence, I understand your point of view in terms of if we're moving the store um, from um, the Glasgow Road site out to um, Necessity Bray, there will be a further um, journey time um, for people who potentially lived adjacent to the store. Um, but I, I feel that the, the level of um, public transport provision um, would be suitable um, and, and shouldn't prohibit them um, from visiting this um, new location. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Williamson, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Convener. I was just wondering if it's possible for an officer to advise me. Do we have the option to actually review uh, or should I say refuse the removal of the um, ability to use that, uh, per, or the existing premises for uh, class one retail use? Um, I think the problem with that, Councillor Williamson, is that the uh, retail assessment is on that basis. If you would actually be going back to square one, you'd have to completely reassess the whole application um, if you did that, you know, because you would be um, keeping retail at Glasgow Road and providing this as well. So that would be additional capacity that's not been uh, assessed in, in the manner set out in the report. So uh, I think the answer to that would be basically no. Have you got something to add to that, Christian? Yeah, I mean, that pretty much covers it. But again, I, I, as set out in the report, you know, the, the impact associated to this has been on the basis of only a small increase in size below, below the threshold, which would require detailed assessment of retail impacts on the, the, the city centre or other identified centres. Uh, so what we're looking at here is, in effect, the taking of the amount of floor space at Glasgow Road relocating them here and adding to it a little bit but beyond uh, below the threshold that would require uh, fairly significant and detailed assessment of retail impact so i think as as uh, uh, my esteemed legal colleague says uh, that we would be going back to square one in terms of considering the retail impacts on the city center does that answer your question council um yes yeah, but i was just wondering about so, so essentially, both both these app, this application is considered the application, the, the uh, approval of the uh, exist, uh, new premises, and the removal of this classification on that. But given what Christian Smith has just said, that there the, the, there is um, the potential that we are moving businesses away out of or should, uh, out to our city centres rather than uh, into our city centres, and just trying to figure out in my head is we, we need to take these together we, we need how we can't well I can't understand why we can't separate them entirely my answer to that of course is that um it's the assessment on the retail is this is the next available site I mean in retail of course you've got um center edge of center and outer center uh, but what's quite clear in the report of handling that this is the next available site and it's not a, so much a question of uh, yes it is 
take this particular business to move, there still remains a site there that, as we've heard, is potentially could be sold and developed in a different way. Um, but essentially, the, the assessment has been done on that basis that it will be an additional increase on the existing capacity, but yes, clearly moving site. I'm not sure if I can answer. Mr. Smith might answer better than I, but um, that's as much as I could say. Yeah, maybe clarifying as well that the current site at Glasgow Road is not in the city centre. Um, it is adjacent or close to the city centre, but it's not within the city centre. And this is, again, maybe a fairly uh, complex technical planning scenario here that we're looking at the options as alternatives to provide the additional offer. Uh, and that is then bouncing out to the closest location to the existing centre. Uh, available for this size of facility, which we're comfortable is the case. Uh, and I think was as was alluded to the Mr Johnston as well, uh, the southwestern side of Perth is also a significant growth area that sees a, a limited provision uh, of this sort of facility as well. Uh, and moving forward in terms of uh, distance to travel uh, to get convenience shopping, etc. We are comfortable with that. So there are many aspects and layers uh, all overlapping in relation to this proposal that sees us support it, uh, but it's not as as simple as as many may think. If that helps any. Councillor Donaldson, you have a question? Yes, it's just to clarify and to follow up on previous questions. Clearly, this application is contingent on what happens with the store, uh, existing store in Glasgow Road. Uh, but let us say that the this is approved, that the new Aldi store at Necessity Prey goes ahead, it's completed. Would this then uh, for the future, and I heard what uh, um, uh, Mr Johnson said earlier, but would this preclude uh, under the terms of the current local and future local development plan, any would it preclude any use of the, the existing site in Glasgow Road for retail use? Um, I'm thinking maybe further down the line. Well, the first point, Councillor Nolson, is of course we're assessing this particular application, but to address where you're going, by that, where this application goes is that. Should you be minded to grant, the permission is not issued immediately. We have to, of course, secure a section 75 for the developer contributions. And yes, it is also indicated that the existing premises in Glasgow Road, the use of that land should be revoked for retail. Now, the, business, the building will still remain and we'll see what happens with that commercially. Uh, but beyond that, I really can't really say too much more. It's simply um, a what would happen would be that, that if once revoked for Glasgow Road, it's not got a consent for retail anymore. So someone couldn't come in and do retail. They'd have to come in and do something else and apply for that. Um, and technically, if someone wanted to come in and do retail on Glasgow Road, they'd have to apply all over again. Uh, but that would then be met by uh, a retail impact assessment. You'd have to go through the whole process for that as well. So just to follow up on that, then once the if approval is given here for the new store at Necessity Bay, this does not preclude further out. And again, I hear what Mr Johnson said earlier uh, about potential interest in the store in the existing store on Glasgow Road, but it would not necessarily preclude a new retailer coming in, let's say a specialty retailer, but they'd have to you know, start again to apply for, for class one uh, approval. Yes. Yes. Yes, so you're going to answer that. Yes, that, that's good. They would have to come in to apply for permission to use the premises for class one or any other purpose. Um, and that would have to be considered by the planning authority uh, as to its appropriateness. And as we've discussed earlier, uh, the volume of floor space in a location out with the city centre uh, may require 
uh, quite detailed analysis of the impacts associated to that. Uh, so it's not a straightforward process, but you cannot preclude anything or say to someone you cannot do something uh, without giving it due consideration. That due consideration would happen through an application for planning permission, which would then be assessed on its merits. Are there any more questions for officers? Councillor Drysdale. Thank you for your indulgence and letting me come back in again um, on, on this issue. Um, so I, I guess my question is uh, um, a legal question um, in terms of where is, is there a potential? Uh, is there any reason why I could not um, move an amendment either for refusal or for deferral? Hear me out. Uh, um, pending uh, further clarity on uh, the intentions for the Glasgow Road site for, by the potential purchaser. I'm just trying to find a way uh, and seeking, seeking guidance, trying to find a way uh, as best as possible to ensure uh, that we are not left with an empty large retail unit uh, in a prominent site. I think the first point to make is that, uh, of course, you've already heard uh, from the developer that you know there is a potential sale, so you have that comfort, if I put it that way. In terms of your role today, what I stress is you're looking at the planning use, particularly the planning use of the site before you. So to go back towards the Glasgow Road site, I think in general terms, I think that it would be a matter for you how you phrased any motion for refusal or deferral, and we'd have to consider that. But I'd be struggling to see how you could link it back to the Glasgow Road site and its long term uh, use. That's something which um, uh, goes beyond into commercial decisions. What this report is saying is, um, or the recommendation is that if you're minded to grant sessions and apply for developer contributions for this site and revoke the retail use on the other side. Beyond that, I think it's back into uh, commercial use rather than planning use. Or give me just a follow up on that then. So given the lack of options here, uh, um, the only, uh, what's what I'm looking for, uh, uh, unquestionable uh, route for somebody who's uncomfortable about this uh, would be to um, seek to refuse permission for this development uh, because it breaches the local development plan. Is that correct? That's a difficult question to answer because if you want, if any member wants to move refusal, you would have to say what policy it breaches uh, and the, you know, why it's breached and what evidence do you have to back that up. Of course, you have with all the details set out in the report of handling, it's up to you to make your mind on that. But I'm stressing that we have to be careful not to link back to the Glasgow Road site. Uh, that's dealt with in terms of looking at the retail impact. And it's also, also dealt with in terms of because of how the retail impact has been done, then you're looking at the revocation aspect of the retail. But I do feel that if you're looking at the future commercial use of the Glasgow Road site, you've had some assurances from the Athen. But beyond that, I think you're struggling. I don't think it's your re reason. I think Christian is going to come in with some more. Yeah, maybe just trying to plain English it uh, and apologies if I, I oversimplify the situation, but any uh, reasoning to refuse the application would have to be on the basis of the primacy of the development plan or other material planning considerations. Uh, however, a material planning consideration uh, does not appear, appear to relate to, well, what happens to the Glasgow Road store if the retail use uh, is extinguished. Uh, so that the future of that is not a material consideration, uh, and I think you know what Colin is, is saying is uh, there are concerns uh, if that is the the direction of travel. Uh, any motion uh, to refuse the application should be based on the planning merits, whether in relation to the development plan uh, and or any other material planning considerations. One of which would not be what happens to the existing premises in the future. 
यहाँ पे यस एंड नो councillor mcclan you have another question actually i did but i don't know um it was with regard to the noise but having read through again the conditions um i i feel that that's the officers have answered through attaching the conditions so thank you uh, is there any more questions for the officers no oh. okay. Uh, I see Councillor James has uh, put forward the motion. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor James? Thanks very much, convener. I, I mean, we've discussed this at length, uh, and no doubt our, our officers have spent an awful lot of time doing their investigation work uh, to come up with the paper here. Um, I've sat on this committee so many times and said you know it's okay building houses but how about infrastructure you know shops doctor surgery stuff like that and here we have an opportunity um and the choice is do we leave it as as mr smith said earlier on in his presentation this land yes is for a different use uh, but it's been in in that use forever and nothing's come forward here we have a, an opportunity to service an area of housing with, with um, a supermarket on their doorstep uh, and I'd be more than happy to um, to go with the officer's recommendation uh, and the conditions applied there so yes I, I recommend thank you thank you councillor James uh, we have a second our councillor Illingworth Thank you, convener. I'm happy to second this. Uh, at the danger of sounding like a previous councillor, I know this area well, having lived nearby it. Um, 34 years ago, when I moved to Perth, there was a petrol station on Glasgow Road. There were two other little shops. Uh, and I think this uh, this retail opportunity uh, will, will replace those um, shops that were missing. Uh, I think it will be great for the locals who live nearby to have a, a proper supermarket right on their doorsteps. And with the expansion of Perth West, I think this will be a real asset to Perth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any amendment? Uh, any comments from members? Councillor Drysdale. Uh, convener, my comment would be following any decision uh, that may be about to be made. I think Councillor Ratch, in, in essence, although Convener didn't say it, that decision has been made, there was no amendment put forward, so therefore uh, the motion is to grant. And I should ask that that is um, clarified, is subject to the amended conditions that were put forward. Uh, yes. That James? Yes, um, sorry, Mr. Elliot. Yeah, I, I thought I said that, you know, with the conditions that were put before us. Yeah, quite happy with that. Thank you. Uh, so the motion at the moment is granted subject to the amended conditions and the, 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 the amended wording. Uh, at the moment, there's no amendment put forward. So therefore, at the moment, that, that, well, that carries. If you want, if you want to make comment. If I may then make, make a comment simply to say that uh, uh, I I acknowledge the uh, the advice offered by uh, and given by officers and respect that fully. However, I, I, I must uh, express my disappointment uh, that it is uh, not apparently um, possible to protect against uh, this situation resulting in a vacant uh, unit uh, on a prominent site on an artery into uh, our city centre. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll now move on to the the next one. It's a uh, item two one slash zero one four eight eight slash FLL. Change of use from a retail unit class one to a hot food takeaway class three and installation of flu at 96 Glengarry Road. Uh, this report will be introduced by Mr. Paul Williamson. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, convener, and good afternoon to all the members on the committee. Uh, as has been outlined already, this application seeks to change the use of an existing shop in order to form a hot food takeaway, together with the installation of a flue at the rear of the property at 96 Glengarry Road, Perth. Next slide, please. This aerial extract uh, shows the location in a relatively central position on Glengarry Road, Moncrief, which is to the south of Perth city centre, running broadly parallel to Edinburgh Road. The property, 96 Glengarry Road, comprises a vacant shop at ground floor level with flatted residential property above. Next slide, please. This illustrates the existing floor plans and elevations of the property with the predominantly open plan retail layout with staff facilities within the single storey extension to the rear. The street facing elevation would remain relatively unchanged as part of the proposal, apart from the provision of a small extract fan within the glazing. Next slide, please. This next plan shows the proposals to alter the property to accommodate the new hot food takeaway use. This includes the provision of a servery area, a small internal seating area and kitchen facilities towards the rear. A toilet would also be provided and the real elevation also shows the provision of the external flue, which terminates just above eaves level. I will now move on to a selection of recent photos, which will show the various elements of the proposal I have described. This first photo shows the western street facing elevation of the existing terrace or parade of properties. The application property is the central one with the sale board above. It also shows the adjacent units, which are occupied by other hot food takeaways, beauty salon and a local shop. Access to the flats above are taken from the respective doors in between the commercial properties at ground floor level. Next slide, please. This next photo specifically shows the application property and its associated shop front. As previously noted, no significant alterations are proposed to this elevation other than the provision of a fan within the left hand window and installation of frosted glass on the right. Next slide, please. We next look at the site from a more southerly point, which gives a greater idea of the context as well as the availability of on street parking and the proximity of the respective bus stops north and south. Next slide, please. Here we see the current rear elevation of the parade, which includes a single storey flat roof extension and the existing flues associated with the adjoining hot food takeaways. The proposed flue is comparable to that shown on the right hand side. Next slide, please. This next photo shows the rear elevation from slightly further north. Next slide, please. And this last photo specifically shows the context of the rear gardens and lane area associated with the terrace of properties. Next slide, please. Thank you, convener. That now concludes the presentation for this application and we now return to the site layout. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, can I now ask members if there are any questions for officers? Councillor Williamson. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Paul, I, you showed a, a picture of the rear elevation of the um, of the building with two flues, and I couldn't really make out uh, whether those flues are actually attached to the building or uh, the freestanding. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. I can confirm that they would have to be attached to the, the rear of the building uh, just to ensure that, uh, that they are securely fastened. Could, could, I, could I therefore ask them, is the, um, well, so the report of noise um, and the, the mitigation measures that have been put in place, I was just wondering whether any assessment has actually been made about the level of vibration that's created by the fans uh when 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 they're turned on uh, Len Reed's going to answer that one thank you um, um no no noise was um 
with regards to assessment with regards to vibration, but it's standard that, that, that any duct work um, will have vibrational mounds on them to ensure that, that there is no vibration coming off. Um, we did ask for further information on noise and um, it was given and there will be a LDR rectangular silencer fitted so that will reduce the noise from the, va the fan even further. And noise from the fan uh, is, is 37 dB, um, three metres from the fan, so therefore the silencer on top of that will further reduce that to a level that will be acceptable and will not affect residential amenity. Is it possible to come back, please, convener? Yeah, thank you. Um, Paul, could you go back to the uh, the picture of the rear, rear elevation with the two extractor fans, please? That one will do. Um, I was just wondering about the combined effect of having three extractor fans and the vibration on that on that building, because um, I would imagine that at the time they built the building standards aren't, aren't the same as at the moment. Whilst I understand there may be some mitigation measure, I'm just wondering about the combined effect of having those three extractor fans so close to residential accommodation with, with the vibration that's going on. I can't answer that because there wasn't an assessment undertaken for that. But each individual, each individual flu should have the appropriate vibrational mounds on it. So therefore, each one should not affect the vibration of the, of the properties. Do you have any more for that, uh, Mr. Williamson? Yeah, certainly just to touch upon that, obviously, as, as Lynn highlights, you know, an assessment or a specific assessment hasn't been undertaken in that regard fully, um, but obviously it is the responsibility of the, the applicant to ensure that uh, they are installed in accordance with uh, the requirements for having those uh, mountings. Um, but similarly, what we're obviously looking at here is the, the principle of it uh, and the design and appearance of it and the principle of the use uh, as opposed to the, the actual technical requirements there. Is that okay for you? Oh, there we go. Um, I, I appreciate well, whilst we're looking at, we're not looking at the te technical aspects of this, I, I, I was wondering about the quality of people's lives if they're um, going to be subjected to the vibrations of the building whilst they the noise is, has been covered. Uh, I just wonder about the uh, quality of people's lives with having the, 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 the external flues up the, up the side of the wall there. Kirsten. Yeah, I think maybe again, trying to simplify things. Uh, manufacturer specifications will deal with the vibration issue uh, and the installation should uh, be undertaken in line with manufacturer specifications. Uh, we are looking at, at noise, so we're not concerned that the principle of what is being proposed here in terms of the flu is inherently going to cause a problem. It would only cause a problem potentially if it was not installed properly, not in line with manufacturer specifications, which we should assume will be the case. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Drysdale. Thank you. I wonder if I can see um, the slide that uh, that shows us the front of the uh, unit itself, please. That's the one. Um, so in relation to uh, uh, what I note, the objections uh, have been, uh, some of these have related to the impact on existing parking facilities and uh, we can all see there directly in front of the unit is a disabled parking uh, area uh, space which uh, I would imagine would relate to uh, a, a local resident because I understand that that's when these markings can uh, can be, be put in like that. Um, I'm just concerned because I, I, I'm familiar with the area uh, and uh, many is the time when I've been there, there's not only been 
uh, no parking spaces, but people have double parked. Uh, of course, they're just popping in for a, uh, a takeaway and they're only going to be a few minutes and all the rest of it. Uh, so is there anything that can be done to um, uh, enforce that disabled parking bay, uh, single bay? I, I don't think there is, but I'm just concerned that uh, this unit, uh, if opened, might result in even greater parking problems for for that disabled person. Thanks. I think we've got Christian answering this one. Yeah, I'll maybe give some comment before Lachlan comes in, and I'll, I'll cover the enforcement of parking control, uh, and that is not something that falls to the planning system. Uh, enforcement of planning control is is dealt with through other legislation, either by the police or local authorities. Uh, so if someone decides to uh, either park in a disabled bay that's identified uh, or park arguably dangerously or inappropriately or inconsiderately, uh, double parking, etc., that would be a matter for either the police or other parking control uh, ma uh, authorities, not the planning system. So we can't control that through this, uh, but perhaps Lachlan can make some comment on the location where people are likely to come from, uh, what the catchment area served by this premises is uh, and uh, transportation issues. Thanks, Christian. Um, Councillor Drysdale, in terms of um, parking, I mean, if if we panned um, through a couple of the other photographs, we will have seen that there were a number of vehicles parked within the, the area along the frontage of the shop. Um, and there were a number of em empty spaces at the time that the photographs um, were taken. Um, I mean, I've cycled past here um, on my way home. Generally, I cycle past um, the frontage of the shops. Um, and, and I appreciate the, your, your comments about some of the ad hoc parking um, that, that does occur there. And as Christian mentioned, um, that would be a matter for um, Police Scotland or our parking attendants if that was to be raised with them. Um, in terms of maybe improving the, the parking along there, um, that's something that we could potentially raise with um, the, the, the traffic and network team um, to see if there could be any improvements along there. Um, I do appreciate your comments about the, the disabled bay that has been installed there. Um, and if we uh, on, on the picture there, um, it did have the plaque that you should be a blue badge holder um, for parking in that bay. Um, but as you um, or I are probably well aware, um, that won't prohibit anyone from parking in there, um, which might aggrieve um, some of the local residents at times. Um, but if these matters are raised with um, Police Scotland or um, our parking attendants, they, they could be addressed through those manners. Um, in terms of the catchment for the, the shop, um, th there are a number of residential properties um, round about. Um, as we can see in the picture there, we've also got the bus stops um, that, 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 that pass the site. Um, so there are opportunities for people maybe to come on the bus um, to, to visit the or, um, or walk or cycle um, to, to the premises. So whilst um, parking or travelling by car may be one means of getting to the store, um, there are alternative ways that people can travel to the store and we would hope that people would walk and cycle um, rather than predominantly relying upon the car to get to the, the shop there. Um, but I think if there are any issues with um, parking in the future, um, the local residents could raise that with um, Police Scotland or our parking attendants to see what we can do to um, create some betterment there. Paul, well, do you want to come in? Yes, thank you, convener. I think it was just to follow on the back of what Lachlan has said, and, and yes, he's, he's quite rightly pointed out that this could ultimately lead to future discussions uh, upon whether any tweaks or improvements could ultimately be made. But for the purposes of this planning uh, application, any improvements to local infrastructure have to be in scale and kind to the development proposed. Obviously, in this instance, the authorised use of the, the property is as a class one retail unit. It could obviously have cars coming and going at all times of the day. Similarly, a hot food takeaway of this size, yes, it will, will also have a, a proportion of, of car use for it, but obviously the other modes of transport are available as well. But ultimately, I think they'd be relatively comparable in respect of the ultimate level of car parking that would be required, hence why in this instance we haven't sought uh, any infrastructure alterations uh, to be to be required. Thank you. Christian, you want to come back in? 
Yeah, I'd maybe just make a comment as well that in terms of the hierarchy of, of means of transportation that we should be considering uh, and prioritising uh, that the use of the private car is at the bottom of that pile uh, and we would need to first of all consider uh, walking, wheeling, uh, bus transport, other sustainable modes uh, and try to reduce the amount of tra ca uh, carbon traffic uh, utilising any development to the absolute minimum uh, and we should use uh, carrots and sticks to try and achieve that for all our sustainability goals. Uh, and I would certainly not want to personally be encouraging uh, people to uh, have the easiest means of accessing any development uh, being via the private car, which is one of the most unsustainable uh, means and also the largest impact on our climate. Thank you. Convener, if I may just r reply or, or um, follow up to these four answers to my one question. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear all that's been said and I understand it all. Um, I, I just, I guess, challenge and question the, uh, the comment that has been made in uh, the report here. that It is considered that there is adequate parking outside the proposed unit. There isn't uh, uh, in in the evenings and so on, and and I just want that noted. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any more questions? Oh. Sorry, Councillor Anderson. Beg your pardon. No, I just wondered whether there was any. I had presence come back on again. Um, just change of use of ours on the whatever the existing shop premises used to what the new ones we've got to we're approving possibly if we do this application today. Who's want to take that one? Paul? Yeah, I think obviously the, the mic's dropped out, but the, the gist of the, the, the question from Councillor Anderson, I think related to existing operational hours. I think as it stands just now, uh, I don't think there are any uh, you know restrictions on the operating hours of the retail unit. Um, obviously, most of them do shut uh, you know, at a, a reasonable time. Obviously, in this instance, um, we do have restrictions in respect of servicing and deliveries uh, to the to the site uh, and also uh, restrictions in respect of noise uh, relating to, to plant and machinery uh, from the property. But um, we actually don't have anything proposed in respect of limiting opening hours of the of the use. Kirsten, you want to come in? Yeah, maybe just say it's not our normal practice to limit uh, operating hours or opening hours uh, when there's no indication that uh, there would be an issue uh, in relation to when the premises were open uh, through normal activities and things. So if we were going to limit uh, the hours that the premises uh, were able to open under the planning permission, we would have to have clear reasoning for doing so. Uh, and as I think Paul has indicated, there is no limit uh, on the time in which the, the, the shop unit could have opened. Uh, and I would speculate that there is unlikely uh, to be limits on the operating hours under a planning permission uh, in relation to the other two hot food takeaway premises on that same street. Thank you. Councillor Williamson, you have another question. Yes, thank you, Kim. I was just wondering if it's possible to, um, when the, the motion does get moved, to incorporate an amend, um, uh, a condition that specifies a minimum standard for the extractor fan. Uh, I, I understand there may be some cheap ones, more expensive ones, and even more expensive ones, probably Rolls Royce types on top of that too. But I was just wondering if it's possible to, get to, to incorporate a minimum standard for. Um, or specify what that minimum standard is to try and reduce the amount of vibration potentially that goes up the side of the building. Who 
who's going to get, get this one? Paul? Yeah, I think there's, obviously we do have condition number four, which is, you know, specifically requiring the detail of the, the ventilation system, um, but it's more specifically with regard to preventing escapes of odour to affecting the residential amenity of, of you know, adjacent occupants. Um, in terms of expertise to then stipulate uh, a minimum level for vibration, um, you know, as Lynn uh, Reid has already kind of highlighted, um, there'll be the manufacturer's specifications to adhere to on that. And so long as they are followed, then, you know, it is assumed that there wouldn't be any detriment, you know, from that perspective of, of vibration. So I would probably be reluctant in trying to obtain a level of detail, which, you know, we may not otherwise have the, the ability to, you know, completely assess. Could I... Christian one. Sorry, Christian. Christian Christian. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think by and large, uh, Paul has covered it there. Obviously, we have condition three, which relates to to specifically to noise, and again is a bit of a belt and braces. Uh, we also have condition four that requires that any system that's incorporated is fit for purpose in terms of odours. Uh, and uh, again, I, I, I refer back to what I said before that. The, the manufacturer specifications will deal with with vibration, as, as I'm sure uh, many of the members and, and others listening today will appreciate that there are British standards that are, uh, cover um, plant machinery and all sorts of other things, and that uh, should cover the vibration issue as well. So again, you know, should things be undertaken as per the controls, the British standards, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there should not be an issue inherent in this planning permission. Is it possible to come back there therefore and, and, and suggest that maybe the wording should, should be complies with the, the British standard, the pre-existing British standard for extra, um, extractive fans? Again, I'd maybe just come come back on that, uh, save it, saving you convener, uh, that the planning system is not here to reiterate, uh, repeat, uh, or add controls that are covered uh, by other legislative manners, uh, matters, hence why we don't cover uh, every uh, exact detail where those exact details, uh, specifications, etc., uh, are covered by other legislative provisions. Uh, so if someone installed a system that did not comply with the British standard, uh, then that would uh, be a failing uh, in terms of the, the material that was used. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions for officers? Oh, Councillor James. Just see you there. Sorry, Councillor James. Uh, yeah, sorry, convener, late one, um, I, which I, I, I've been listening and, and to be honest, uh, have a, a lot of sympathy with what other people have been asking uh, regards noise uh, and everything else. Uh, uh, question for our, our officers. I, I, I'm looking at the report and, and it seems, you know, they're happy with with our policy, or, or that it can it complies with our policies. But our, I, I have reservations regarding that the the traffic, this sort of property, or, or this sort of business uh, generates a, a lot of takeaway. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so you're going to get delivery drivers, uh, and the late opening in a residential area. You know, is this an over provision uh, and um, are we happy? Uh, I'm just looking at policy 17 uh, residential area. Uh, proposals will improve the character and environment uh, of the area uh, and improvements to shopping facilities. Is this an over provision? We've already got the shopping facilities. Is Does this actually comply with policy 17? And um, are we happy this isn't going to create problems uh, rather than um, or not add to what, what's already there, should I say. Thank you. Chris, are you going to come respond to that? Yeah, maybe, and then uh, Paul can come in after me if, if he needs to. Uh, I'll maybe put my camera back on. I think you it's how you interpret those policies. Uh, and as we can see at the minute, this is a vacant unit uh, along a parade of shops, uh, and there is a proposal uh, to revitalise that unit, although for an alternative use to what was consented previously, uh, and that may be seen as, as beneficial to the, the local environment. Um, 
in terms of transportation, etc., and I think we've covered that that earlier that uh, there is appropriate parking standards uh, in relation to how uh, access to the premises should be prioritised in relation to the hierarchy at which the the private car sits at the bottom, uh, and then in relation to um, and I don't know if you were perhaps alluding that that delivery drivers etc may not park appropriately uh, that we've covered how uh, inappropriate illegal dangerous uh, or other uh, undesirable parking actions may be covered whether that be through police scotland or pkc's own parking attendance if that helps answer your questions thanks christian yeah it, it kind of does but i, I I'm, I'm also just looking at the picture that we've got on screen at the minute you know with 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 looking at a range of shops or previously a a range of shops you know going from a, a mini market up to you know uh, the takeaway next door but we're putting a, another food supplier or a takeaway yeah, should i yeah, say next yeah, door yeah, to a takeaway yeah, which comes yeah, with yeah, its own set yeah, of products. I, I, I maybe didn't answer fully, uh, probably because I'd forgotten that part of it, and my apologies for that. Uh, but I think what you, you'd sort of indicated is over provision, uh, I think was your word, or competition, etc. And that's not a, a planning consideration uh, in this sort of thing. The market will decide uh, which business succeeds or fails. Uh, and the other point I'd maybe make is, and again, I don't have the information in front of me at the minute, but I don't understand that there are any controls over opening hours on the other premises on this street. And I think, and again, maybe Paul can, can confirm if I'm wrong, uh, that there are another two hot food takeaways in this parade uh, and they don't have controls over hours of operation. And we've, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, there are no justified complaints in relation to any of the concerns perhaps that have been raised. Thank you. Uh, I see there's no more questions in the chat. Are there any more questions in the room? No. Oh, can I call for a motion? It's like Braun. <laughs> it's only got to come from there to there and it's taken for age. Uh, Councillor, uh, do you want to speak to the? Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I'm going to call for a motion to reject this application. Um, I feel that um, the crux of this is residential amenity, and we have a duty to protect residential amenity where we can. Um, I'm concerned uh, about the fact that we already have two uh, food takeaways in the area, uh, which comments made. On what I've read online are already causing parking problems. I appreciate we have a photograph on the screen at the moment, but of course that's taken in daylight. Most of these parking problems are in the evenings when people are at home, they park their cars, and there's people. And with all due respect, um, most people who go into a takeaway will go by car. I think that, that's the way it is at the moment. Um, I can't see people taking a bus to go to a takeaway and having to catch a bus to get back home again. So, I'm concerned about residential amenity. I know antisocial behaviour doesn't come under planning, and I appreciate that, but it does play a part, I believe, in residential amenity. This is the concern I have uh, for the people who live there. I don't think we're, 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 we're tackling that responsibly to deal with that. So when it comes to policy, um, I'm uh, policy 1A. Um, I don't think it complies with any of policy 17, and I might consider policy 60B a, but I'm going to obviously take um, uh, advice from Mr. Elliot on this. I'm sorry, I'm moving away from the microphone every now and then. Um, it might be perhaps worthwhile seeing if anybody would second me first to see if we can do that. I don't know it's up to the to do that. Councillor James, you're second on the motion. Yeah, thanks, convener. I'm quite happy to second uh, Councillor Braun's uh, motion to reject. Uh, again, for the same reasons, uh, policy 1A, which which um, Councillor Braun's already mentioned. I'd also uh, uh, mention policy 56, noise pollution. Um, 
the pres presumption against the siting and development proposals, which will generate high levels of noise. It is a residential area, and I think you know it, it will only compound what's already there and add to it. So, will create noise. Um, I, I think I already I'm here desperately flicking through the LDP, which I've got on the screen, um, uh, and I think I also uh, put a note against. Um, Policy 17 residential, but I can't I haven't got it in front of me to actually quote at the moment. Sorry. Um, yeah, and again against policy 17. Uh, and, and I was looking here uh, uh, in particular uh, subsection C proposals will improve the character uh, and environment of, of the area. I don't think this actually will. It will add to the noise. Uh, the, just uh, I don't think it will add any benefit to the area. Thank you. So quite happy to second. Sorry. It's gone really quiet. Can do you get that? Sorry. Councillor James is calling out here, just Sorry. pausing a little bit to kind of write that down. Uh, of course, um, it may be easiest if I, rather than referring to the policies, refer to your reasoning, because I do have, um, I shall say, very strong concerns over the competency of this at the moment. And if I go forward and explain that, um, just to be clear, you are not assessing over provision or need for this particular change of use. Um, this is not something which. Uh, you're looking at the individual unit and the assessment of the individual unit. Um, there are already two units here, that's true. But you're looking at this individual unit and its change of use. In terms of the parking, um, as we've heard, it's been assessed that already are good bar parking and I appreciate that there all can, can often be problems of parking, but that's not a planning use problem. That's an enforcement issue which isn't for you. In terms, I, you, I, I may have caught your own Councillor Braun, but you mentioned antisocial behaviour, but again, not your remit. You know, that's elsewhere, that's for the likes of the police, etc. Uh, now, lastly, in particular, Councillor James mentioned noise. Um, now, uh, the report indicates that there's been an, ass an assessment of noise, particularly in relation to the flu. Uh, and it, it, there's also, a, and it can be conditioned for the, the kind of noise levels. So I would have to ask you, um, what noise are you referring to and what evidence do you have to back that up? OK, with the noise, um, yes, you've already uh, explained the extractor fan, uh, which will um, add, add to the noise of the area. And by the very nature of the business, uh, you know, street noise, uh, noise with, you know, affecting residents. How many times have, you know, I've lost count the amount of times I've been called by people, you know, about this very sort of noise. Um, I thought the planning process was there for us to to prevent it before it happened. So, so it, it's the noise that the, the business brings. I think I appreciate what you're coming from, Councillor James. We all have the kind of a practical experience, but when you come to the if like the planning use and the legalities of it, um, if there are people who are noisy, that that could happen already. With, you know, because there are already existing shops there. There's already an existing unit that has class one retail use. That could already happen. And it's difficult to therefore lay that at the door of this particular proposal. Um, and of course, that gets into if individuals are causing noise, that's really an enforcement issue as well. If they're causing disturbance outside, antisocial behaviour, which includes noise, that's something that's not so much your remit, that's more for the police. I appreciate we've all got our experiences um, of what can happen. But in planning use terms, I think that's going out with your remit into different therapy. So at the moment, I'm afraid uh, I appreciate, no, I fully appreciate where you're coming from. We all have our practical experience, but in planning use terms, uh, the parking is really an enforcement issue. Uh, the antisocial behaviour belongs elsewhere. It's for the likes of the police, etc. And uh, I see so far on and not that if it's deep noise, that's something that can happen anyway. And I, I have a difficulty seeing how that would be competent to refuse on this particular application. Yes, so Bron's about to come in. Uh, 
I think the um, the central point I was trying to make was residential amenity uh, uh, rather than antisocial behaviour, um, and the accumulated effect of another through takeaway on people's amenity in the area. Now, if you take policy 1A, for example, it was the first sentence which I was thinking of, the development must contribute positively to the quality of the surrounding build and natural environment. Now, is that, is, in my opinion, is it's going to make it worse by another takeaway put in there. Now, you're going to come back a minute that. And, and also, it was policy 17 was the, the structure, the central point of it. Thank you. I appreciate your thought, but if you I appreciate where you're coming from in terms of residential amenity, but then you have to see what the harm is. And essentially what you're doing there is putting in an over provision policy and saying you can only have a certain amount because this one will cost too much more. So you do come back in yourself, unfortunately. Um, so that, that is a difficulty there. Uh, so um, it is a different way of thinking of policy 17, but in reality it's over provision. On, on your advice then, Mr. I think we'll have to withdraw that then. Reluctantly. <laughs> I'll reluctantly unsecond it then as well, Bob. Convener, if I, if I may come in just on, on this this issue. Uh, <clears throat> so if I've understood Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Elliott correctly, uh, Parking, uh, despite the fact it's mentioned in the report, is not an issue that uh, we should concern ourselves with um, in in this committee. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, I, I do recollect uh, other inc incidents, uh, uh, other cases where parking is absolutely an issue and and was deemed competent. So I'm just trying to understand whether. The, the whole issue of parking and if if there is a disabled par person parking there that struggles to park as it is and we're going to make the situation worse. Uh, is that not residential amenity? I think when you come back to the parking, Councillor Drysdale, of course, my understanding from the report, it's been assessed as already adequate and there's already an existing retail use there. Um, if there are people who disobey what the rules and what's already there, that becomes an enforcement issue. So I'm not saying uh, parking of parking can uh, um, can be to certain standards, and provided those standards are met, um, you know that's what you're looking at. But if people don't obey the regulations and the, the directions, that's an enforcement issue. Um, you know, perhaps not being clear enough, but maybe Mr. Smith or Mr. Williams might want to, even Mr. McLean might want to come in. I can m maybe come in again just to try and maybe provide some clarity on on planning considerations, and I, I think to an extent, uh, Mr. Elliott mentioned there, but it's remembering that there's an existing class one use approved for this unit. Uh, no parking is being lost, uh, and the level that is there relative to the extant use for class one is deemed as deemed as being appropriate. There's been a, not, a much discussion uh, on different times of the day uh, and uh, the way in which people may choose to use their vehicles, which may not see them use uh, identified bays uh, and either double park or park in disabled bays or in bus stops, etc. All those aspects uh, not relevant. All we're, we're saying here, perhaps Councillor Drysdale, for your purpose is Officers are of the view uh, that the arrangements in place are adequate and that the change in use of this premises uh, will not result in uh, a significant enough change to be worthy of refusing the application. Uh, but obviously it's for members of the committee to decide and set out why they perhaps are of a contrary view. Looking for a motion now. I'll put it forward as a motion. Seconded. To approve.
just to be clear to all those uh, appearing virtually, I think that was Councillor uh, Convener uh, moving Grant per the report. And if I caught it right, Councillor Williamson was going to second. I think we're calling for any amendment. Uh, Do I have any amendment to it? We have two other items to go. Uh, how do the members want to have a 10 minute comfort break or we want to just continue? Continue? Yes, no problem. 10 minute right. comfort break would be really appreciated, convener. Thank you. Call it five then. Five, yeah, five, five is fine. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, so we'll continue. Uh, the next one on the list is uh, 22-00228 slash FLL, installation of two CCTV cameras in retrospect at Logiaman Estate, Logiaman. And speaking to this, I believe, is Mr. Paul Williamson. Thank you again, convener. This application seeks to retrospectively seek planning permission for the installation of two CCTV cameras on a five metre high timber post within the Logie Almond estate west of Perth. Next slide, please. This aerial extract shows the location of the site in a rural landscape between Bacante and Red Gorton, located a short distance north of the B8063 and northwest of Glen Amund College, which lies on the southern side of the River Amund. The track leading past the application site ultimately leads up to the Logie Amund Shooting Lodge and beyond. Next slide, please. This site plan illustrates the small scale nature of the proposal on a small island of land between two access tracks, the right hand one of which is also a core path leading beyond Logie Amund Shooting Lodge and ultimately connecting across to the A822 at Amory and Loch Fruchy. Next slide, please. This next plan provided by the applicant shows the zone of visual coverage from the CCTV cameras southwards towards the estate entrance at the bend of the public road. The small extract photo also gives an indication of the view obtained, as well as the tree line nature at the start of the track and foliage within the adjacent land. Next slide, please. This first slide of photos provides a view northwards from the public road onto the Logie Amund Estate access track and associated core path. The topmost photo shows the tree line start to the track and associated entrance pillars, while the bottom photo taken from the pillars shows the pole mounted cameras immediately in the foreground beyond the trees in a central position. Next slide, please. The second slide of photos is taken from further north still and now show the pole and cameras in slightly greater detail as the track emerges beyond the initial tree lined track. Next slide, please. This final slide shows an elevation of the pole and CCTV cameras together with photographs of the pole in situ. Thank you, convener. That now concludes the presentation for this application and we now return to the site layout. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williamson. Uh, are there any questions uh, from, for the officers from the members? Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, convener. Uh, let me cut to the chase. Page 9239, core path immunity. Uh, can I just ask of officers, um, I've been involved in the past with Path and Canoss Countryside Trust. I'm no longer a, a director or a trustee there after last week. Uh, but this is not just about the countryside, it is about our core path network in Path and Canoss. So, can I ask just a very straightforward question? Has the planning, uh, have we as a planning authority any time in the past given approval for the installation? of surveillance cameras, CCTV cameras on any part, other parts of the core path network. Kirsten, you want to answer that? Yes, thanks. And, and, and thank you for your question, Councillor Donison. I, I don't have a direct answer to it, but I can tell you that there are many, many CCTV cameras across Perth and Ken Ross and the wider country, uh, and I would guess uh, that a number of these also cover core paths, uh, but whether the fact that their core path is covered uh, is not a particular issue. Indeed, this application before us does not impact on the core path in terms of its routing or the ability of people to, to retain access to it. Yes, but uh, surely with core paths, the very nature is uh, to give people you know, the, the freedom to roam, the right to roam, uh, the, uh, the, the liberty and freedom to access the countryside. 
or not, if they go from point A to point B, to feel that they're going to be on camera. Um, and it's, it, I know we can't consider here civil liberties issues, but certainly privacy issues, and also you know, our, our policy as a council for individuals to be able and families to be able to access the countryside. And this seems to be going against it. I, I take, for instance, on paragraph 37, we talk about the nature of the CCTV equipment. And then it states that in terms of security, the visibility itself of the CCTV equipment can act as a deterrent to unwelcome individuals. But surely we are, want, with our core paths, to welcome individuals and to access the countryside. And this is all, you know, it's a question of also that this is a retrospective uh, application. That concerns me. Um, and, you know, we have, have every right as a planning authority to uninstall these cameras. Thank you. Paul, you want to come back on that? <laughs> I think obviously what Christian's largely answered already, you know, goes before it. Um, the considerations with this are the visual appearance uh, of the cameras, as he's correctly outlined as well. They don't impinge on the ability to utilise the core path network in any form. Um, I would indeed, you know, consider that if you were a, a law abiding citizen and just utilising your, your rights for access, then the presence of the cameras ultimately wouldn't disturb you. Um, you'd be covered in very many areas, whether it be in city centres, whether it be in your vehicles on, on motorway networks, etc. already. So, you know, the considerations in this instance are the visual impacts of the proposal uh, within this local landscape. Thank you, Irina, if I could come in. Um, this particular core path is in a, I'm going to describe it as a very rural loop, but core paths cover a variety of different areas urban, rural, or semi-rural, rural. Um, now, um, I haven't done an assessment, but I have no doubt whatsoever from general experience there will be CCT cameras covering some core pass somewhere. Um, this particular example, uh, my understanding is it's private land but used by the public because it's a core path. Uh, now, the other aspect I'd want to say is that, um, just to be clear, that the privacy issues um, about people walking on a core path and being filmed at the same time that's not really the remit of the committee. That's something that's dealt with under other legislation. I don't claim to be an expert on that other legislation, um, but that is dealt with elsewhere. I'm going to leave to others to ask questions, and then I'm going to. I want to come back. Okay. Right, thank you, uh, Councillor McLam. You've got a question. Hello. Yeah. Uh, my concerns are very similar to Councillor um, Donaldson. Uh, this, the the sort of civil liberties, um, the right to roam, the provision of these the CCTV here. I, you know, what protection is there to the public over the right to roam? Um, and the freedom of access, uh, how, how will the public's right to that be protected if the CCTV cameras are allowed to remain in this location? The sheer, the sheer presence of them is an intimidation and it's been noted, you know, that, that, that one of the concerns of the application is intimidation with intent to deter public access. Um, so I have strong concerns about that aspect of uh, the public's right. So could the officers maybe address or um, give me more satisfaction on this concern? Who's going to come in on that? You, Paul. Well, I, I was going to come in first, uh, if you'd be with me, convener, and then Paul can perhaps come in. I think maybe, you know, in a, giving some some clarification of the considerations here. So we're looking at land use uh, and visual appearance and in terms of impact on the core path uh, and, and people's ability to access routes, uh, if there's any physical barrier uh, to them using uh, core paths, 
uh, and there is no physical barrier associated to this proposal. Uh, it may well be, and again, I appreciate uh, where uh, Councillor McLaren is coming from, that people may perceive that they are being discouraged uh, to, to walk along here because they will be filmed. Uh, but again, you know, perhaps they should be concerned if they are undertaking any actions which perhaps are questionable. Uh, and I think that the quotation in, in paragraph 37 comes from planning advice note 77. In this context, it's perhaps being read out of context, uh, but unwelcome individuals as per in that situation of Pan 77, talking about security issues and where there is unlawfulness uh, or other things going on, not people perfectly legitimately uh, walking along a core path, uh, which this application will not restrict people's ability to physically walk along that core path. Uh, if that helps clarify, Councillor McLaren. Um, yes, it does. But the sheer presence of a CCTV to some of users of a core path will seem um, a, a deterrent to use the, the core path in its very existence. So, and it does say here in paragraph 39, page 92, they are being used as a deterrent. You know, <laughs> and to assist the police, there's an assumption that the behaviour of the public is is not lawful by that statement. I, I appreciate that you're reading it in that way, uh, Councillor McLaren, but I, I think that the intent of that comment is a deterrent to unlawful activity where the police uh, would have a remit uh, so that the police don't have to get involved uh, if there is rural crime uh, going on, something which you know is, is becoming unfortunately more and more prevalent. Uh, so I can understand the two sides of, of the story. Uh, but in this case, we are looking at what is the land, land use and visual impact uh, of this proposed uh, poll and CCTV camera, which the applicant indicates is for the purposes of security relative to rural crime. I, I understand um, and thank you for your answers on that. But then if this is retrospect, does the applicant have evidence to show that there has been rural crime that requires such um, such an installation to happen? Councillor McLaren, if I could step in, that the, Sorry. The, applicant, the applicant wouldn't need to produce any evidence of that. Okay. What they're looking at is their future security rather than uh, what may have happened in an individual location. Like most CTTV, it's about what happens in the future. Um, all we can say is the applicant uh, has applied, uh, yes, in retrospect, uh, for the CCTV. Yeah. For, the, for their own security purposes. And I'm back to saying that I, I, you know, mm -hmm. I'm um, conversant with the issues with the core pass and rights away, uh, something which I gave advice to Community Green Space on. The difficulty there is that the issue of privacy and being monitored by CCTV is one which lies elsewhere, not in really the planning use. I'm not sure I can usefully add anything more, but I'm aware there are other. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Hmm. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mollison. Um, I take on board what you just said, uh, Mr Elliott, um, but I was just wondering if there has been a, a history of a dispute between the landowner and people getting a right of access across the land in order to better understand the, the rationale. Um, or to, to hopefully to try and allay the fears of people who are actually walking, you, you know, using right of, right of accesses. Uh, whilst I understand there's no um, physical deterrent to walking the land, there is that intimidation which uh, which under, undermines some of this. But I just wanted to know if there is any information that uh, could be provided around about the um, any conflicts around about right of access across this piece of land. Yes, Councillor Williamson, there obviously is a bit of a history, part of which is in the, the report of handling. In fact, um, there was a previous application at committee that some members may recall um, um, to do with the installation of gates, which were going to 
uh, end up diverting the core path parallel to the existing road. And as much as I would wish to say is that yes, there were um, the, the applicant uh, put that forward and there were objections received which were deliberated on and determined by committee and that application was granted. Uh, but the report I'm handling also gives you some uh, attempts to give you some reassurance if you want to put it that way. Um, and I think maybe I've deferred the planners on this occasion, but of course you've got information as to the relative limited nature of the CCTV is not something which my, to my understanding of the writing of the report handling, there is not someone sitting 24 hours a day watching the CCTV and it's directed towards the track and people coming in and out into that particular estate. Um, it is not uh, also, I think I'm correct in saying, Mr Williamson will correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think they are not roving cameras that are pointed in one direction as my understanding. Mr Williamson, could you confirm that? Yes, certainly, Mr. Elliot. Yeah, my understanding is that they are fixed towards the access track and the site entrance specifically, uh, hence why the applicant has gone to the lens of providing the plan showing the uh, extent of visual coverage. Thank you. Councillor Donaldson, you have another question? Yes, um, I do think this is a question of principle. Um, I want to follow up on. I do want to follow Council up. Council Dawson needs to be questions. No, I, I I just want to follow up on the questions that have been raised by Councillor McLaren, and uh, I support her comments. Uh, the 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 question is that this is potentially a deterrent to people using core paths if they want to go from point A to point B. Is it not the case that they may well be on camera? It's going to prove, uh, you know, a lot of people will be concerned about this. Um, also, you know, we are referring here to uh, them being used as a deterrent to report any criminal activity. And uh, we're talking about unwelcome individuals. We want to welcome individuals to use the core path. So our core path network. Now, I hear what they said about your know, areas you know, near to settled areas or in, in towns. Uh, there is, in, in, in many cases, a need for CCTV, but this is different and this is core path network. So I just want to put forward that um, we do have the option here. I've not sat on the planning committee previously to reject this application. And, and and for these uh, two cameras to be uninstalled, yes. Councillor Donaldson, it's quite difficult to answer that. We're in a questioning session at the moment. Um, of course, members always have the option to consider grant refusal. But it's then for you to articulate why a refusal should go forward. And in particular, you would have to advance the policy and why it's reached. And potentially evidence as well, but certainly the policy and why it's breached. Um, difficult to provide much more than that is, uh, you know, obviously the applicant said this is becoming more common for rural estates to have CCTV. Um, that's a matter for you to make your mind up, but I do have to come back to in terms of impact on core path usage, what you look at there is the physical usage, you know, and it's not preventing the physical usage. I appreciate some people may not like CTVs, I get that, um, but it's not, uh, it's the particular application does not prevent people walking along the path. Um, as you as you've correctly said yourself as well, it's very likely there are other core paths elsewhere where there are CTTV coverage of those core paths as well. So, but, but again, it's a matter for members on this particular application to put forward any motion and then assess that. Councillor McCann, you've got another question. Yes, thank you. Um, now, if this application, if this was not a retrospective application, would there have to have been a justification as to the need for the installation of CCTV more than this retrospective application gives? Paul, are you going to answer that? Yeah, thank you, Councillor McLaren. Um, 
No, it would be assessed in exactly the same manner. Um, there would be no question or as to whether or not there was need. It would just be assessed on its own planning merits and against the, the relevant policies of the, the local development plan. OK, thank you for that. Are there any more questions? No. Uh, can I ask for a motion then? Councillor Braun, you've... Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm uh, moving a motion to uh, to approve the paper. Um, if you are going about your lawful business, uh, the existence of CCTV should have no bearing on what you're doing. Now, I appreciate the comments made about the right to roam, and that is a, a given right for people. Uh, but during this conversation, nobody has mentioned the rights of the landowner to protect their property from criminal activity. And I think in many cases in, in the today's world, we have to get the right balance uh, to, to do this. The CCTV equipment has no bar on people accessing the core path whatsoever. Um, it's designed purely to uh, uh, recognise if there is any criminal activity. Ordinary people, law-abiding people have nothing to fear, as they do from no CCTV. Uh, so I am happy to move the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see we've got a second. Councillor James, you want to speak to it? Thanks, Convener. Not a lot more to add to what uh, Councillor Braun. This is in my ward uh, and it is a hot topic. I, I, I take the points on board which people are, are, are making, but CCTV can either be your friend or your enemy, depending on what day of the week it is. Um, I, I think the landowner has a right to protect his property in this case, uh, uh, and I'm quite happy to second my colleague's motion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any amendment? Councillor Donaldson. I don't know if I'll get a second there, but you will see I wish to oppose and that this application be rejected, that the two CCTV cameras that have been all installed already, and uh, this is going to now be, it is a retrospective application and I pose for the reasons I've stated already, and I think there's a real danger that people will feel that using core paths, that they are, you know, being surveilled, uh, that it is part of surveillance, and we do not want people to be deterred from using the core path network. I think there's a difference if it is near or close to settled areas you know, where there might be antisocial behaviour, but this is right out in the countryside. So I oppose. Do we have a seconder? No, there's no second as to the amendment falls. I'll, I'll second. Thank you. Councillor Brown, do you want to sum up? Thank you, you're in. Not really, no. I think I've said what I, what I thought on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members. Um, I will need to clarify the full terms of the amendment. I'll come to that in a second. But before you, at the moment, you have a motion to approve per the report from Councillor Braun, seconded by Councillor James, and an amendment to refuse by Councillor Donaldson, seconded by Councillor Williamson. Um, however, if I could come to the amendment, um, as I said earlier on, it needs to be a uh, linked policy. So I need to ask you which policy do you think it contravened uh, and why? I know you've, uh, the retrospective element you've mentioned wouldn't be a ground. It's simply this is an application before you. Uh, I know you've mentioned the detriment to for, for path users, um, but you need to refer to the policy and then the reason why. Yes. 
as of course you've already heard my comments about the it's not physically officers have commented that it's not physically obstructing um, so I think we need to start with the policy ground first of all So I did. Um, yeah, I, others may not have heard that, but Councillor Williamson suggested a, a, a short adjournment to resolve this. Um, that's a matter for you, whether you wish to do that. Ordinarily, in the past, we have not done that, but it's um, something that's really a matter for convener. I appreciate it is the first sitting of the new committee. Um, I will draw a member's attention that there is one policy on public access, which is policy 15 of the local development plan. It's not legislation that we're driving at here. It's the local development plan. And whether any individual policy there is contravened, and the most obvious um, one is the one that deals with public access, is policy 15. It's a matter for you yourself, Commissioner, if you want to allow for a quick adjournment for that to be considered. Councillor Brown, you want to speak? Yeah, I was going to say, if you want to have a, access, a recess, I can lend the local development plan to my colleagues. They can have a look at number 15 if they want to. I'll, to ease it, so, cause, because obviously Councillor Donaldson isn't a regular member of the. I'll the allow five minutes. That's okay with him.
that everyone back in? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Donaldson, do you have terms of an amendment? Yes. Um, I wish to propose refuse as the application is contrary to the local, the Perth and Kinross Local Development Plan 2, LDP 2, 2019, Policy 15, Public Access, as the proposal would unreasonably affect public access rights. Last sentence, the use of CCTV in respect of a rural core path would unreasonably deter the public from wanting to use the core path. And that's what I propose. Is yes, that competent? Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Williamson, do you agree with that? For those that are virtual, yes, Councillor Williamson agreed with that. Again, the mics are not working perfectly. Uh, all I can say is, oh, while uh, I can't say that's incompetent, um, you've heard officers before about the concentration of um, not physically object, uh, uh, restricting a core path. That's as much as I can say, but it is for my, uh, members to make their mind up. Now, members, we will go to our roll call vote, but just to remind you before we get there, um, Councillor Braun, you did um, think you've uh, waved something up, is that correct? Did I get there? Yes, yes, I thought so. Um, I, or at least you were asked and you didn't sum up. That's probably more accurate. So members, what you have before you is a motion by Councillor Braun, seconded by Councillor James to approve the report. Your amendment by Councillor Donaldson, seconded by Councillor Williamson, is to refuse on the terms outlined by Councillor uh, Donaldson. Uh, Mr Williams, over to you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Elliot, and uh, thank you. Also, in accordance with the stand, uh, council standing orders, I'll now take a roll call vote. Um, when I call your name, if you can let me know whether you'll be voting for the motion as proposed by Council Braun or the amendment as put forward by Council Donaldson. I'd just like to point out for full public dexterity, uh, through the course of meeting um, from the start, we have lost a couple of members who've had to leave the meeting in due course. So, from the start of the meeting, uh, Councillors Bailey, Brock and Illingworth have all left. So, um, as I say, when I call your name, members, if you let me know whether you'd be voting for the uh, motion or the amendment. So, I'll put my switch. So, um, Councillor Anderson. Motion. Councillor Perron. Yeah, Councillor Anderson, switch. Councillor Bob, can you just confirm that was motion? Motion. Thank you. Councillor Donaldson. Amendment. Councillor Drysdale. Motion. Councillor James. Motion. Convener. Motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLaren. Amendment. Councillor Stewart. Amendment. And Councillor Williamson. Amendment. Um, so, members, uh, I'm at five votes in favour of the motion, four in favour of the amendment. That's just been confirmed with Mr. Elliott. So, therefore, the uh, motion will carry. Right, we move on to the last one today. And it's uh, number 22 slash 005 229 slash FLL. It's an erection. Erection? Oh, it is. All right. Yeah. 
of an agricultural building land east of Moravere House. I can't even say that. Creef. Och the tire, Creef. And to introduce the report is Mr. Paul Williamson. Thank you again, convener. Uh, and uh, yes, you'll be delighted to know that this is the, the last application on today's agenda. This application seeks full planning permission for the erection of an agricultural building at Moivaird House, Ochter Tyre, which is in a rural location a short distance to the west of Creef. Next slide, please. This aerial extract shows the location of the site to the west of Creef beyond Loch Monziverd, and the site itself is located a short distance north of the A885, which connects through to Comrie. The extent of agricultural land, which covers approximately two hectares, uh, extends eastwards from the applicant's house, Moiverd, uh, and wraps around the game field, which is located to the immediate east of the proposed building location. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates the proposed site layout and shows the provision of an upgraded site entrance connecting through to the location of the agricultural shed in a position in the northeast corner of the land adjacent to the estate road and an existing four metre high beach hedge. Next slide please. This last slide shows the L-shaped layout of the proposed 45 square metre building which would be 9.6 metres in length with a maximum width of 7.4 metres the height to ridge would be approximately 2.7 metres. In terms of the finishing materials, walls would be forest green tongue and groove cladding with a black corrugated bitumen sheet to the roof. Thank you, convener. That now concludes the presentation for this application and we now return to the site layout. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Are there any questions for the officers? Oh, oh sorry, I do apologise. Sorry, I do apologise. The, the deputation, uh, uh, Mr. Ewan Cameron, the applicant, uh, is he online? The height range would be approximately 2.7 metres. Mr. Cameron, have you got the uh, uh, teams on at the background? Yeah, I put it off, sorry. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr Cameron, I'm going to hand you over to the Deputy Convener who will uh, go over uh, how the deputation uh, works. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr Cameron. Hi there. Um, you're wishing to make a deputation. Uh, you have up to 10 minutes and I will... Actually, Actually, can I just can I just jump in there? It's, I, I'm actually just here just for in case there's any uh, questions. That that was all. I, I, I don't need to be. Uh, there's no need for a deputation. It's really just to see if there's any questions from the panel. Yes, I'll open that up to questions from the panel. Thanks. Any questions for Mr. Cameron or Mr. Bell? None. There's no no questions for either of you, so you can actually drop <laughs> off now. You can actually leave now. That'd be great. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, mate. So back to questions for officers. Any questions for officers? No, none at all. Can we move the motion? Move the paper. Yeah, seconded. Any amendments? <laughs> no one. Right, thank you. Approved. That concludes business for today. I'd just like to thank everyone for coming along and making it a relatively easy uh, first convenership for myself. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Braun. Yep, thank you, your convener. I didn't get a chance at the beginning, so may I just congratulate you and the vice convener for taking over the position of convenership. Wish you well. Um, it was a bit of a baptism of fire today, because normally we finish before lunchtime, but uh, well done to both of you and congratulations for taking it over, both of you. Thank you. Thank you.